Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. Good morning once again and welcome to the somewhat delayed sunrise safari. We do apologize for the technical gremlins that appear to have been attacking our system each and every time we try and say hello to you all at the start of our drive. My name is Jamie and I have Jeandre on camera with me and we are coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains game reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And not only are we live, but we're also interactive, which means that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, we've come racing through in this direction on this chilly, cloudy, wintry morning here in the African bush to follow up on a report that the monkeys were alarm calling at something in this area. Now this is a report that came through to me from one of the other guides on our Game Drive channel. Now, I've stopped here and I haven't heard anything. It's all very, very quiet around a road that we call Ingwe Alley. Now, the road where the leopards move about on, essentially. It's called Ingwe Alley because this is where all the leopards were. And we're going to try and figure out exactly what is happening here because of course yesterday we were, if not hot on the trail of Karula, then certainly warm on the trail of Karula. The Queen of Juma, the female leopard that spends most of her time in this area, with her two five-and-a-half-month-old cubs. Now, yesterday, when I went to try and find her, the area was packed with elephants, which, of course, makes tracking somewhat tricky. And then we had to rush across for Arethusa for a very special afternoon, spent with Salayeshe and Tiani, her daughter, First time I think Tiani has ever been on the live safari, so a very, very exciting sunset safari that we had yesterday. And then lions roaring from Buffelshook, where there is a, an elephant that has died of natural causes. But unfortunately what that means is once our lions discover it, I think they're going to settle down for a feast that will last at least three days, probably a week or more. As you can imagine, an, a, a dead elephant, even for lots and lots of hungry lions, provides a buffet-style meal for a considerable period of time. Okay, well, since we are true to form, there's a water buck over there, but it's very far away, so we're just going to show you briefly. Oh, and it's just its bottom right now. A, a e male water buck with its dark fur, just all puffed up and chilly, first thing in the morning. And since our water buck is wandering away from us and presenting us with a rear view, combined with the fact that I'm sure you are all very, very excited to hear about somebody else's travels, I am going to send you over to Brent, who cannot hold off telling you his wonder about his wonderful adventures any longer. Oh. And isn't that a glorious horizon to the east? Welcome to the Sunrise Safari here on Safari Live. And of course, for those of you who know, my name is Brent and I'm back from Rwanda. It was a bit of a really a sort of fly-by-night trip. We're only there for two nights. It was absolutely incredible. Fascinating country. And I'm sure you guys got lots of questions. And remember, questions, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email me questions at wildearth.tv. So we are looking for Queen Karula. Um, that is the dominant female leopard in this area. And uh, we haven't found any tracks yet, but I'm hopeful she and the two little darlings will come and give us a nice hello or welcome back. So we're checking around at Treehouse Dam at the moment. And uh, it is uh, not too cold this morning, and I'm quite thankful for that. It's about 14 degrees Celsius, 54 Fahrenheit. So a pleasant morning out. And as you saw, an absolutely spectacular sunrise uh, to the east. And uh, the clouds seem to be breaking up, and I'm quite happy about that. 
and uh, not too much wind, it's slight breeze, and uh, it's good to be back in the bush. And from a very green country, where I was, was it yesterday? No, the day before, um, to a very dry country now. So on average in this part of the world, we get about 400 mils of rain a year. Uh, for example, where we were in the Volcanoes National Park, gets 1,600 mils of rain a year. So a very, very different environment. Oh, game drive radio. Oh, there we go. So tracks of a young male leopard, probably naughty little cinderlai, um, heading west up Gallagher Shortcut. So we're going to check this area, and if we get no tracks here, we're going to go see if we can help Aubrey follow up on those tracks. And it is an absolutely stunning morning, as I said, and I'm so happy to be back in the bush. And I, I think I did something in the last week not many people can ever say they've done. So I went from leopards fighting in a tree on Wednesday morning, uh, by Thursday evening, I was on the edge of the Volcanoes National Park. And on Friday, um, I was at over 3,000 meters uh, looking at gorillas in alpine moorland, uh, full of bracken stinging nettles. That was actually one of the big surprises. So they tell you to wear long pants, and I'm not a big fan of long pants, especially if the weather's warm. And it was, but if you don't wear long pants, you will literally be completely taken apart by all the stinging nettles. And, uh, and the wild celery, which is one of the gorilla's favorite foods. I will be posting some pictures shortly. Uh, I think this evening I will post a, a gorilla picture. We did have some incredible sightings while I was there. I don't want to give too much away because there is a video of what we saw coming. But I can tell you we went to the Sousa group. And uh, the Sousa group is the group for the fit people. And, oh, let me just turn this down. Oh, did you see that, Dave? And I forgot to say, I have Dangerous Dave, the objectified dish on my camera with me today. Oh, look at this right next to us here. Oh, it's disappearing. Can you see it? There. You got it, Dave? Okay, uh, down in that, f uh, come out of it. Uh, you see a little bit to the left. You see a little movement there, center frame. Zoom up a bit. Up, 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 up. Okay, just stay there. There's a, you'll wait for the movement. So down to the right slightly. A little bit more. There we go, you see the movement. There we go. Now, let's see who's awake. And let's start with a bird quiz. And uh, well, when we actually get a sight of the bird, there it is, hopping around in the little fallen down thorn tree. So if we get a sight of the bird, I, I want you guys to tell me what bird this is. And if you know what bird it is, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter when it finally decides to show itself. And it's a nice little LBJ, a little brown job to get the grey matter working, the sunrise safari. Oh dear, that was my... Oh, I don't even know what that is. Oh, that, that was my alarm from Rwanda, that's why it's going off. <laughs> Sorry about that, I do apologise. Anyway, Dave's got the bird, and Joey's wondering if I saw any new cool birds in Rwanda. I did, I saw about I would guess about seven or eight new species. Unfortunately, as I said, it was a very much a quick trip. I didn't have much time to bird. Um, I got some beautiful new sunbird species. I got the Rizuri double collared sunbird, as well as coppery sunbird and violet backed sunbird. Um, and those were all in our hotel garden. We didn't actually have much time to do much else. And there we are. Dave's still following the LBJ quite nicely. And I'm sure our serious birders already know what that is. And we're going to leave the LBJ and keep looking for sign of Queen Karula. So while we keep looking for a leopard and you guys think about what bird that possibly might have been, uh, let's go back to Jamie, who has a gorgeous vista to show you. While you have a think about what a bird it is that Brent is trying to get you to guess, 
we do indeed have a lovely vista playing out in front of us. The sun slowly attempting to struggle its way over the clouds and giving us a beautiful view. Very picturesque. And we've been... Not really, it's actually not been as bad a cold front as I was expecting. It was so warm over the last few days that I was really expecting to have a brutal cold snap. It really hasn't been that bad yet. It makes me a little bit nervous about the weather that we're experiencing. We're in the middle of winter, it should be utterly freezing, and yet here we sit... Not shivering at all, first thing in the morning. And bear with me one second. Brent is trying to call me on the game drive con, so let me just hear what he wants me to do. Oh, never mind. Too late, I missed my chance. <laughs> There's the lion calling. Far away. It's a lion calling. I'm trying to listen exactly where it's calling from. I think it's outside of our traverse area. It's difficult to tell with my earpiece in, but I suspect it's around the Buffelsook Cheetah cut line boundary. So I think I'm going to go follow up. I mean, this is a beautiful view, don't get me wrong, but there are things to find on this winter's morning, and we can't dilly-dally looking about, looking at sunrises the whole time. Let's go and see if we can't find some lions, especially since that female with the young cubs will probably have returned back to that den site in order to feed them. And depending upon whether or not they've discovered that elephant, she may well then decide to move them a little bit closer, which is definitely not something we want to miss out on. I'm still waiting for my chance, by the way, to respond to Brent. I'll just wait a little bit patiently. Still a conversation. Nope, still not. Uh. Oh well, we tried. It was very optimistic, but now Brent is having the conversation. Nearly there. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's lots happening this morning. It sounds as though they've just found a leopard to the north of our boundary in Buffelshook, so the property to the north of where we are, but potentially coming south. I don't know whether it's a male or female just yet. I'm going to find out now. Our Brent standing by. I didn't either. It was an update, um, and I didn't hear anything further, went and sat around Ingwe Alley, didn't hear anything. Copy, I think I'm gonna take Gallagher shortcut and then go east from there. Cool, now that we've made all of our arrangements as to where we go, Something I want to do quickly with all of you on board, which is go to the old hyena den, because there are tracks up and down Gallego shortcut once again. Doesn't look like the whole clan before we all get our hopes up that they have returned to Juma. They moved, they all sort of packed up their stuff and shipped off to Manuleti, which is north, north of Buffelsuk. And we think it was prompted by the presence of the Unkuhumas pretty much constantly on Juma. We think that that actually pushed them and their cubs a little bit to the north. However, there is still one female, the one called Gwen, with her two new cubs and I suspect because of her ranking within the clan, I suspect that she's staying away from the rest of the youngsters or keeping her babies away from the rest of the youngsters. So she's quite low ranking, which means that while her cubs are young and vulnerable, she can't fight for them. If she sees them getting bullied or chewed on by the other hyena cubs, the older hyena cubs, there's nothing she can do to rectify that situation because she runs the risk of finding herself incurring the wrath of 
the higher ranking females. Now, I'm still hoping that she might be around here and since we're on Galago shortcut, I figure we might as well give it a go. Let's go and investigate. I'm moving relatively quickly through this area because Taxon's already driven along this road so I know that with his expert tracker fan he would not have missed anything that might be moving along here and he, he really just drove along here so I don't need to worry about something walking on top of his tracks Speaking about early morning sounds, of course, one of our favorites is the sound of the ground hornbill calling first thing in the morning. And AJ Mirabel is just wondering when last we saw a ground hornbill. And you're right, AJ Mir Mirabel, it has been, it's been a long time since we last saw a ground hornbill. I'm trying to think when we last saw one. I think the last one I saw was on Cheetah Plains, the three of them on Cheetah Plains. That was ages ago. Sure, very good point. I, do, I can't think of any other sighting since I came back to work three and a half weeks ago. Hmm, very good point. Now they do, the one thing about the ground hornbill is that this time of year they actually don't call as frequently as they do in their breeding season. They tend to they tend to go quite quiet and they only really start calling in October once again. But perhaps that's why, perhaps they've been around and we just haven't realized because they haven't been calling to alert us to their position. And woe is me, sadness and heartbreak, the hyena den is very quiet. How terribly, terribly sad. Does give us a nice opportunity to just sit and listen. And if we have a look at the bird on the top of the buffalo thorn, let's just have a close look. I think we've got a scimitar bull there. Hold on a minute. How lovely. A nice one. Oh, I should have actually added to Brent's bird quiz there and asked you about that. And it's giving an interesting call. Usually scimitar bills have a high-pitched whistling song. But this one is just giving off a chirping call. So, whilst the hyena den might not be occupied, it has provided us with a really really nice bird to tick off our list. Scimitar, scimitar like the the farming tool, um, S-C-I-M-T-A-R, no, sorry, S-C-I-M-I-T-A-R, scimitar, scimitar bull. Okay, listen, obviously we don't ask Jamie to spell things first thing on a Monday morning. That's what we've learned from that. But a really, really nice one, one we don't often get to get on camera. Oh, and we've got another view of the sunrise, accidentally. Beautiful. <laughs> and welcome to Francis, who has asked me a question that sort of makes me quite sad not because of course of Francis's question but just because Francis wants to know if we ever see any spotted hyena Francis we used to see them pretty much every single day they were either at this den site or the one a hundred or so yards away and then well there's a couple of other den sites that they used to use we got to know them I would say I wouldn't say well, I would say we got to know them pretty much as well as any guide knows the different hyenas of the area. We got to know the intricacies of their clan dynamics, and we still do. 
Unfortunately, our clan has moved their den site a little bit outside of our traverse area. We don't even get them calling anymore around camp, which we used to all the time. But never fear, because at some point they will be back. I saw a hyena yesterday, actually, with the leopard killed. It was such an awesome sighting. Hyena sitting down in a in a sort of a river system in the sandy bed, waiting, looking up at the two leopards that were snacking on an inyala above them, waiting for the scraps to come tumbling to the floor that it could hoover up as it was wandering up and down. So yes, we see spotted hyena. Did we used to see them more often? Yes. Um, I'm quite devastated because my happy place was to come and sit at a hyena den and just watch their dynamics. We used to, we would have hyena cubs coming right up to the vehicle and sniffing the vehicle, occasionally getting a little bit too adventurous and trying to nibble on the tires because hyenas are clever and curious and they like to learn in that way. Sorry, Mike's just chatting about some lion tracks that he's found coming in to Juma. That's very interesting. I know Brent is around that area, so we're going to keep an ear out and just listen for, follow. Uh, there we go, Brent's on it. Brent's on it, never fear. Brent is back. Brent the cat master. So Francis, we do see a spotted hyena. They have devastated us <laughs> by moving away. I'm very, very sad about this. But you never know. And you have to just keep watching because we will never be able to predict exactly when they are going to come back. Brent, sorry, what was the update that you got from around quarantine? I'm just on Gallego shortcut now. And look at our crested Franklin nibbling away. Copy that, thanks. I'm going to take uh, Gallego Pan and check around in Vubu Road just in case they've gone around the back there. Okay, the Franklin is lovely, it is beautiful. But we have things to find, and apparently the people at camp are reporting that the lions are calling much, much closer than we realized. Which is exciting news. Must be Connor who picked up on that. Connor and Jerry enjoying their morning in camp, being serenaded by the lions. Can, sounds like a good way to enjoy a Monday morning. Okay, let us go and investigate. Whoopsie. Sorry, everybody. Bumpy, bumpy. This is the one thing about the Gallego shortcut den, it's really tricky to navigate around, especially with a large sort of two meter, six foot antenna sticking up out of the back of your vehicle. Here we go. And of course the beanie saga continues, but I'm not even going to say any more about that. Just excuse me every time I try and yank it back down over my ears. I have hopes, I have high hopes for this morning. So many exciting things happening. Judging by the amount of conversation that is happening on the Game Drive channel, many, many exciting things on the cards. All right, so while we race off to check one area where the lions were calling, let us find out how Brent is going to choose. Where is he going to go and check next? Decisions, decisions, lion or leopard? Um, since the lions are making a noise, I think we're going to look for lions. We've got some lion tracks next to me here, but I think they're from yesterday. This is the area Steph was working on the Sunset Safari. So the mating pair could be around the corner, but I can hear some flapping wings. And well done to James Richard, who got the bird quiz correct. It was indeed a rattling cysticula. And in the large jackalberry. We've got quite a few different species. I can hear some grey go-away birds, but I also heard the sound of a 1980s computer, which means there are green pigeons in there somewhere as well. There they are. Bottom. There we go. Just, there we go. They've found it. There we go. 
was a green pigeon. And to me, they always sound like those old Bond movies where the villain has the huge supercomputer, that do -do 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 -do. a very, very distinct call. Now, the Afrikaans name for a green pigeon is, is, is a very descriptive one. It's called a papakai dove. And what that means is that a parrot dove. So it's the only member of the dove or pigeon family that has zygodactyl feet. So instead of having three toes forward and one back, it's got two toes forward and two back. And they are fruit eaters, so it enables them to clamber like a parrot across a tree. And, of course, at the moment, the jackalberries are coming into fruit. So they are literally uh, full of the fruit eaters. And the two biggest fruit eaters we get are the green pigeons and, of course, the grey go-away birds. And the green pigeon being far prettier and far nicer to listen to than a grey go-away bird. Of course, they're being very quiet now. So I said there's lion tracks all around here, but they've been driven over, so they're not fresh. Um, but hopefully, they're going to be around the next corner. And that's the wonderful thing about being on a live safari. We can't script what's going to happen next. So we're in the middle of the bush, and the northern Saabi sands, uh, which is part of the Greater Kruger, which is part of the... Well, what's, let me just remember now. Uh, the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. So there's about 8 million acres of unfenced area where animals can roam free. So, of course, there are boundaries that we can't cross, but the animals are more than, more than welcome to meander where they please. As I said, those lion tracks are not fresh. They're elephant. The elephant tracks on top of the lion tracks as well, so not fresh. And this is also the last area the Karula's tracks were in, so we're doing a, a double check. Uh, morning, Michael. Michael, welcome on safari with us today. Uh, Michael would like to know, do we have fences around camp? And do we ever have, have we ever had lions in camp? Um, not since I've been at Safari Live, but in other places I've had lions in camp regularly. And speaking of lions, no, they're still being driven over these tracks. So, well, those look quite a bit better on, on your side there. Dave, you see the lion tracks? Okay. And so, Michael, uh, we do have an elephant fence around camp, and that's to keep Ellie's and basically just elephants out. And camp itself has got a fence to keep everything out. Now, shh, but don't tell Brian. Brian is a gardener, and he's on leave. And he planted a whole bunch of, if, he, if Dave was already laughing, he planted a whole bunch of sunflowers. And he was very proud because they were about this big. And even one of them had a flower. And because of the drought, the bush bucket came into camp and literally <laughs> mowed them to this high. Um, it's a... Uh, we do, and the elephants actually pushed the fence open the other day and uh, started, ch literally smashed all the trees, nearly pushed a tree down onto um, the camp, and we spotted something up ahead. Ah, there's some, speak of the elephants, um, and the lion tracks are still heading in that direction, but there's some Ellie's there, so let's go have a look at the elephants. See where the lions went. I think the lions went back up towards Treehouse. But, oh, lots and lots of elephants around at the moment. I've never seen elephants in the Sabi Sands like I have this year. I hit my record. I must have seen about 300 in a day. Um, and that was, but I had drive in the morning, then I had to go to a rangers meeting in the middle of the day, and it was down at, in Coral. Oh. Hello, we've got Ellie's on top of Termite Mound. I'm quite keen to catch up with Benjamin Button. Hopefully this is his herd. Now, for those of you not sure who Benji is, Benjamin Button is a little elephant calf. He looks way older than he is. He's got big wrinkles all over his forehead. Hello. Lots of bellies. They're incredible animals. Here we go. Yes, 
hello, giving us a good sniff. Coming to, a little closer to inspect. No, it's after the tree. So you can see the front of our vehicle there. That elephant's probably about four feet from the front of our car and literally taking no notice of us. Now, it's really fascinating. I think just before I, I, I left, we counted how many species a single elephant bull ate in about 20 minutes that we were with it. And it ate nine different plant species in that time. And you're going to find the elephants are eating a lot of plant species that if it had been a normal year, they wouldn't eat. So they're feeding a lot of spike thorns, terminalias, uh, and even monkey orange, which is something if there had been more rain, they wouldn't actually focus on. Oh, there's a, there's a big cow coming through. Here we go. Hello, madam. Well, I think it's a young boy, actually. He's only got one tusk. So, since we've already done a bird quiz, and even though I was only gone for four days, it feels like I was gone for two weeks, and I think you guys really need to be tested. So, who can tell me what tree is that elephant feeding on? And bonus points if you can get the scientific name. Uh, what tree is that elephant feeding on at the moment? And remember, answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live on Twitter. What is the elephant's breakfast? There's something wonderful about just sitting quietly with a herd of elephants. Oh, big cow behind, about to come into frame. There we go. She's also only got one tusk. Oh, we can hear them. They're talking. Hello, mister. Dave, did you shower this morning? I think the elephant's smelling you. No. You did shower? Mm -mm. Oh, you didn't shower, that's why. Did you think? I did, actually, yes. <laughs> oh, there we go. Tusk in the bum. Move out of the way, I'm bigger than you. Now, I know a lot of people get very worried about the drought and what happens to the animals, but drought is natural, as is flood out here. And in the long run, the fact that elephants are feeding off all these different species, it's going to cause bigger open areas that will hopefully stimulate grass growth, which will increase our grazer numbers. So it's good for the zebras and good for the wildebeest. Um, even though quite a lot of them might die this year, um, the genetic stock that's left is the sort of cream of the crop. And if we get good rains, uh, with all the trees being pushed over and removed, it adds a little spot in the sun for the grass species to grow. And the, the better grass you have, oh, she doesn't look happy with that young bull. Now, elephant behavior is always a very interesting thing. You can just see there's a slight stiffness, and it's not because of us. It's because of that young bull there. And she might have a little bit of misplaced head shaking at us, but we haven't annoyed her. It's, it's the young bull. You can see, even though it doesn't really look like she's upset, there's just a slight stiffness to her walk. She's just not 100% comfortable with that young bull. Now we're just going to move forward slightly to answer my budgie. And a huge safari dive welcome to my budgie, who's a new viewer. Now, my budgie is asking, why do elephants only have one tusk? Well, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we've only been looking at two elephants that have one tusk, but he has one with two tusks. 
So normally they have two tusks. If they have one tusk, um, they've generally broken it while feeding or fighting. Uh, or fighting in the male's case and in the female's case, feeding. And there we go. Normally they have two tusks, and then you can see that little one has got two tusks. Now, this particular individual is feeding off an acacia and has got masses of hooked thorns. And if we had to grab any of those branches like that elephant's grabbing, our hands would absolutely be ripped to pieces. Now, the best way I can describe the inside of an elephant's mouth is it's like an old, tough piece of leather, like a boot. And, and you can see, happily munching on the thorns with little effect. So we've got a couple of answers for the tree that the elephant was feeding on, which is next to us now. Um, oh wait, we've got someone charging in as well. Hello. Oh, lion's roaring. Okay. I don't know if you guys heard that. It was a bit in the distance. Um, I'd say around Buffalzook Dam, but possibly to the north. I'm just going to call on the radio quickly. Angala um, Audio sounds to the north of Buffalzook Dam. Okay. So we had a couple of answers to the tree quiz. And uh, I think I've finally caught some of you out because so far no correct answers. So there it is. So we've got one person who says it's a red bush willow. You're in the right family, wrong tree. And someone who says it's a monkey orange. Unfortunately, it's definitely not a monkey orange. I'll try to show you a monkey orange a bit later. It is a bush willow. So it's part of the Combretum family, but it is not a red bush willow. So there we go. I've given you a hint. So Joey, you are in the right family wrong individual species so keep guessing so we're going to leave these ellies now i want to just double check up ahead where the lion tracks go i just heard lions but they sounded like they're out of our traverse area but i'm pretty sure that mating pair should still be around and their tracks are still here Good morning, Felicity. Another viewer from the land of the long white cloud, New Zealand. And Felicity would like to know, are there any nerves in the tusks? Do they, do they hurt when they break? So very much, it is a tooth. It's, a, it's actually a, a, a modified, um, not K and incisor. And they do have a complicated nerve system. So we only see about, a, there's about two quarters of a tusk that's inside. And inside that, is a very large nerve so if it breaks deep it does hurt and they can damage the nerve and they can actually get abscesses and and and, um, and they can go septic um, but from both of those animals and sometimes elephants are born with one tusk or with no tusks uh, so unless there's a break that's visible it's very difficult for us to tell and we've still got the lion tracks heading north so i'm going to keep on these for now i'm just going to call them in and Gonzo for Wanuna Wansa Tingala, um, heading northwest on Twin Dams uh, towards uh, Spaghetti Junction, Chelepan. Okay, so we've still got the tracks there. And uh, as most of you know, I normally have tea in my... Oh, very interesting. Jamie's have got tracks up ahead, but they're going southwest towards Zoe's Road. So it might be the same animals, but uh, we did get an, uh, uh, an update from the guys on Arethusa that they heard lions calling around in pile of planes. So I think we're going to stick on these tracks for now, 
and if we have no luck then we'll head in that direction but these trucks are going now more to the the northeast towards Buffalo's Hook uh, Dam where we heard that where I heard those lions calling a bit earlier and I'm hoping they haven't managed to just keep going straight through and out of our traverse zone. Uh, Felicity ah oh now you guys are guessing I said it was part of the bush willow family so it's definitely not a terminalia Well, I think I need to get... See, I've only been away for four days and, and, and you guys are getting lax on your quizzes. Come on, you guys know this tree. Okay, I don't... That lion tracks are still here. So, as we're saying, Felicity, yes, there are massive nerves um, in, inside an elephant tusk and, and it can hurt when they break if they break it deep. But uh, it doesn't look like those two are any pain. There's no abscesses either. And we are going to go across to Jamie for an update. But before we do that, it's time for another bird quiz. You got him there, Dev. Oh, he flew. Okay, well, we're going to have to uh, do a bird quiz a bit later. Uh, that bird disappeared. Uh, so while we keep on these lion tracks, uh, let's go see how Jamie's doing on her lion tracks. Oh, interesting uh, times lie ahead for us. I know that Brent was giving you my update about the tracks that I found before his bird then fell, flew away. Interesting stuff because we've got tracks for Shama. I, I didn't realize he had lion tracks and not leopard tracks. I thought he had leopard tracks. He's got lion tracks. I've got leopard tracks. Really fresh leopard tracks. And I'm going to tell you about them in a moment. But first, let's wait for the zebra to come through in front of us. Awesome. There is such a tiny little foal wandering through. Come on. little bit nervous on this windy morning. Here comes the little foal. It's going to... Oh, no, it's stopped. It's got nervous. It's <laughs> behind the rest of the family. Here it comes. It's coming here. You'll see it coming out here. Here we go. Hello, little one. I love zebra foals. They are so fluffy. <laughs> Cute to look at. And they grow so incredibly quickly. Oh, through the dip. Better catch up with Mum. Mum's already gone. Now, one thing that we were incredibly, I say we, James and the viewers. Run, little one, Mummy's there. We're incredibly privileged to witness was a live zebra birth out on quarantine. And who knows, this could actually be that foal. Although I think it's a little bit too young for that. It's something that I wish we could have followed up on. We were never able to, but imagine that, a live zebra fall birth. And here come the rest at quite the pace, actually. Oh, no. slowing down for the dip. Racing across the open area. I wonder if something's got them a little bit nervous. I'm not even going to make the zebra crossing joke. You can all make it in your own minds. Ha ha ha. Awesome. Now, I don't want to delay for too long because I suspect that those alarm calls that we started off our morning talking about were in response to a leopard. Uh, it's, what is interesting about those tracks that we found, it's one big set of male tracks, either Vula or Tingana sized, one of the older leopards. And then there's a smaller set that is almost, almost the size of a big female. Here comes the straggler. 
behind all of the others. And now there's angry elephants trumpeting in that direction. It's interesting. Sorry, I know our zebra are really lovely, but I am distracted by what we found. Two sets of leopard tracks, really, really crisp, fresh, beautiful tracks. One coming in this direction, about the size of Sindile's tracks. Can we guarantee that it's him? No. Do I think it's him? Yes, I really, really do. But what was interesting was the presence of the other older male's tracks. Our Mvula is currently the leopard that they are sitting with just to the north of our boundary on Tamburti Dam. And I wonder whether those two haven't been following each other around and encountering each other since we last saw them sharing a kill. I don't know which way around it works. When I spoke to Kheri, he even suggested that Mvula might decide to follow Sindile. And I mean, this is just, we, this is such a, an unprecedented scenario with Sindile that we don't know exactly how things are going to play out. And he suggested Mvula might actually follow Sindile, kind of start to share his kills on a more regular basis, or vice versa. Now, Sindile's tracks split off this way. The older set of male tracks, I don't know exactly where they went. I don't think they've crossed out, but Vula might have turned around and gone back north. Speculation, I know, but let's go and investigate because those alarm calls came from the direction that his, tra his tracks are heading in, and they are, it's very soft sand around the Galago pan, but they're beautifully fresh. You can see each and every crisp outline, and that's why I want to put a little bit of haste to my journey. So much for my plan this morning, which was to go straight to Bufflesuk Dam. Clearly that's worked out very well. As is my hat right now. Oh, speaking of Sindile, of course we then start to wonder about his mother Shadow and her little cub. That James is nicknamed Zara, but not in brackets, not the official name. Um, and Michael Fleetwood, you were wondering what the latest update on Shadow is. Well, we went racing forward into Arethusa. When was it, John? Was it was two days ago. Well, it was two days ago. Two days ago, on a report that Shadow was on a kill. Unfortunately, she had lost the kill to a hyena, but apparently the cub and her were safe and sound. We never figured out exactly where they went, which is a bit disappointing, but just one of those things. We never figured out where they went. But we know that she is, or at least as of two days ago, alive and well, well fed. Apparently she managed to eat a lot of that kill before she moved off, or before the hyena chased her off. But she is alive and well, as is her little cub. I know that Steph touched on it yesterday, but it's so interesting the way that Sindile keeps... The, the way that he's moved since he's been released back into the Sabi sand, the fact that he hiked all the way into Kruger to Skukuza and then moved all the way back into his natal range. And so the place where he grew up. It's a, such a fascinating, I don't know, behavioral study I guess is the way to describe it. I'm uh, moving quite quickly. I want to just check this two track. The other thing I've noticed about Sindile, but it's dangerous, it's a very very dangerous assumption to make. I mean, not, not that dangerous, but he seems to walk the same paths. He seems to walk the same roads. He always follows this route across the western end of quarantine and then through the drainage system along here. I say always, he's done it about four times, but that's still, I mean, leopards, leopards do become creatures of habit, except for Karula, to whom none of the rules will ever apply. Just speed up a little bit. Cover a bit more ground. And check at the same time that I haven't missed his tracks coming across, but I don't I think he's cut south towards Rebecca's Road. There is also a chance, by the way, if we build up a little bit of excitement, that Mvula might decide to get up and come south. He is very close to our boundary. I'm hoping that he might decide to do that.
But there is a river system that leopards love to move through in this area that runs all along the edge of quarantine and provides a really pleasant sort of basically a hiding hole but also a highway for them to move through and he probably you'll probably find that he walked along here it's just a number of escape routes for a leopard and a number of hiding spots and they can walk through undetected which is one of the big reasons why we always always check the river systems or what we call the drainage lines in the area like this particular one pops out at Philemon's dip which is where Aubrey said he heard those alarm calls I have lost the tracks by the way I'm no longer on them they're coming this in this direction and there's a road that will we should pick them if he's moved through that block we should pick up on them as we go along it all is very very quiet you see what that is John Doe? old hyena okay, cool. I was just asking John Doe since he can lean over that side of the vehicle makes life a bit easier it doesn't help being short because you can't see over the front of the Land Rover Exciting, exciting news. If we don't have any success here, we're going to be doing a very rapid race towards Cheetah Plains. But I'll explain that to you if we, depending upon what happens. Uh, copy that, Andrew. Confirm those Ngala visible from the boundary. Copy that. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. I just want to double check Rebecca's road and then I'm going to head across there. Hey, I've got an exciting thing happening around Cheetah Plains. And I think, actually, oh, I don't know what to do now. There's too many things. There's so many things to choose between. I think we're going to hold off on our trip to Cheetah Plains for now. I just want to check Rebecca's road and see whether there's any sign of these leopard tracks popping out. I've driven this road twice now and Brent has as well so I'm not too bothered about speeding past. And then hopefully we'll finish off a well, hopefully Mvula will decide to come a little bit further to the south. So we've got leopards everywhere. Karula's still somewhere here, I'm sure. We just have to find them. Jandre has just picked up on tracks along the road. It's a civet track. <laughs> uh, moving on swiftly. Uh, Cat, yes, Karula will absolutely want to move her cubs away from all of these males wandering about. Now, Mvula, she might be okay with. She has mated with Mvula, so she might, but still, I don't think, I think Karula's, one of the keys to Karula's success in terms of cub raising is that she really doesn't take any chances. And what it seems that she, from what we can tell from the tracks, what it seems like what she does is she takes the cubs away 
leaves them somewhere and then goes and actually physically intercepts the male. We don't know this for certain, but this is what the tracks indicate. She'll take the cubs away and then she'll go and she'll almost pull the male away from her cubs and towards a safe, towards a safe distance away from them. Now, Sundile, as lovely as he is, is an enormous threat to Karula's cubs. Uh, it could well be, you're absolutely right, Kat, she may well have decided to move her cubs a little bit further to the south, but then she might not know that he's here. He's not calling, he's certainly not scent marking, he's far too young for that. He is basically playing a game of be as secretive and subtle as possible. And at the same time, I think he's going to go straight back to where Shadow is. Somewhere on Arethusa or Hoffman's, I think he's going to go and try and find her again. I don't think he's quite given up on the idea of being accepted by mom again. Which, of course, is never going to happen because she, her attentions are thoroughly being lavished upon her new, new cubs. Oh, well, Jandre is forgiven because I just pulled over for white-tailed mongoose track. So we shall forgive Jandre his er the error of his ways. And while we concentrate both of us on tracking the right animal, let's send you back across to Brent, find out how his morning's going. So we've followed those tracks from where Steph had the lines yesterday all the way to Buffelsook Dam. Uh, I lost them just before Buffelsook Dam. I'm trying to get a direction at the moment. And even since I've been gone, the water's just disappearing, and I don't even think old Bob the Bachelor Hippo has got a spot anymore. But I'm just trying to see where these lions went. Um, I just want to check on the soft sand up there. The lion audio we heard earlier was in this area, but I, I unfortunately have the sneaking suspicion that it was north of our, our boundary. Here we go. Let's have a look here. Okay, so there's no lion tracks on this side. Oh, there are. Ooh, that's interesting. Now, I know I've been away for a few days, and it seems like that female might have moved her cubs from the den um, that we had just above here, and these female tracks are going down towards the drainage system here. And I'm definitely not feeling brave enough to go play with the lioness. Now there's tracks coming in and out, and they're only female tracks here. So there's a very strong possibility in this little river system below Buffalo's Hook that she's put the cubs there. But we're going to go check the den first. Um, there were a lot of ellies there, so she might have moved them. Uh, but I'm, and I'm I'm quite surprised she hasn't moved that den earlier. It could be because with the lion densities we've had on Juma at the moment, and the hyena den moving into the Manuleti, that she feels quite confident that she doesn't have a threat actually from other lions at the moment, because the, the Birmingham boys are, are seriously dominant, uh, and the fact that the hyena den has moved further to, further to the north, that it's probably okay to leave them in one place. I think if, if the hyenas had been on Juma, she probably would have moved that den multiple times. So those tracks are coming. The, the cubs could still be there. Let's go have a look. So the tracks of the mating pair, I think, have gone along uh, Buffalo's Hook East rather than West. We're on Buffalo's Hook West at the moment, or they've gone towards Quarry Pan. So we're going to check the den. If we get nothing at the den, we're going to head around to Cheetah Cut Line. Uh, and I also just want to check the northern boundary in case they've just shot straight across. Because I think that lion I heard roaring was definitely in Buffalo's Hook, or if not, right on the boundary in this area. And as I was saying earlier, most of you know I like my Earl Grey tea in the morning, but uh, I've just come back from Rwanda and Rwanda's got incredible coffee in. And this is a particular, particularly nice bend that says uh, it has hints of bourbon and dark chocolate, and it does. Very, very delicious coffee. Mmm, yum. So, and uh, here is Joey. You got that tree correct. It was indeed a variable bushwillow 
and no one got the bonus points for the scientific name. It's Combretum calinum. And uh, if we look at a red bush willow, which is this one here, you can see the leaves are much, much smaller. That's actually not a good red bush willow leaf. Let me find a better one. And they're all curling at the moment, dropping off the trees. Uh, there we go. And a red bush willow is Combretum apiculatum. And the best way to remember is that on the edge, there's a little pick. So a little sharp point on the edge of the red bush willow. Also, the leaves are much, much smaller than the other bush willow species. Now, uh, Zaheri, which is the large fruited bush willow, which some of you thought it is, um, the shape of the tree is a bit different. Uh, the variable bush willow can be very confusing because it's got, sometimes it's got big leaves, sometimes it's got medium sized leaves. It all depends on what type of soil it's growing in. So, uh, I would say we don't have that many large fruited bush willows here. We have a lot more calinums and even the fruit, the variable bush willow, hence the name variable, it's, it's got lots of different shapes, sizes. Uh, but generally a little bit smaller than the large, large fruited. The large fruit has also got very big leaves and it's more sort of a, a clump uh, rather than a, a standalone tree. But again, it can be very confusing with, with the trees and uh, it all depends on the area that they're in quite often how much water they have access to, what soil types they're in and that can dictate how they grow. Okay, so we multiple checking. We're checking if that mating pair of lions has not left our Trabos area. We're also going to go check the, the lion den to see if those little delectable monsters are still there. Jamie's found leopard tracks, isn't that exciting? But we're gonna, you're gonna hang with me while we go check for that Nkuhuma lioness. Fingers crossed she's still there. And as I said, she chose such a good den site. Uh, and when it comes to cats choosing den sites, it's not only the inaccessibility uh, of them, it's, it's also very good that it's not on any major elephant paths or near roads, because other predators like hyenas often will use roads, etc., to, to march and patrol. So if she's, she's far enough off the main roads and uh, n n along no major elephant paths that a leopard or a hyena or a nomadic male lion might use. Okay, we're about to arrive. Oh, I realized as I went past that tree, all my lights are still on me. It's a bit light for lights. Now, it's possibly, these little lion cubs are possibly the only thing cuter than Dangerous Dave we have out here. Dave is chuckling and and, and, and I think we might have to put them on camera a little later. Mm. <laughs> okay. So let's have a look. Are they in the drainage line or are they still in that thicket? But as I said, I think it's quite possible she's moved the den because she has been here for nearly... two weeks. Okay, so we're just going to listen. And sometimes it's quite difficult to find them. I mean, they're, they're generally right in that little thicket and you just pick up the tiniest bit of movement. You can actually see where the lioness has been feeding them, how she's completely flattened that area. I don't think they're here anymore. I think she's moved them to the, the west of Buffelsook Dam. Well, there we go. So I think she's moved the den site. Um, there's no sign of them in the drainage line. So we're going to have to find the next den site. Oh, hi, Michael. Uh, Michael says, is it safe to assume that that mating lioness has lost her cubs? Because when we first saw her mating, she had very visible suckle marks. 
Um, and the fact that she's literally been mating for I think five or six days now with two different males, I think Michael, yes, it is safe to assume she's lost those cubs. So what killed them is a, a very, hmm, no, that's a very interesting. This is a male lion track here. And I think this could have been the mating pair. We're gonna check up on the boundary now. Uh, but yes, Michael, I think it is safe to assume that she's lost those cubs. Um, and uh, as very sad as, sad as it is, it is, it is a very common occurrence out in the wild. And lion and leopard cubs have, for their first year, about a 70% mortality in the Sabi Sands. And normally, uh, from known deaths, uh, the deaths are due to not hyenas and not other predators, but it's normally uh, males of the same species, uh, nomadic males, uh, and even in some cases with lions that uh, the dominant coalition will eat their own cubs occasionally. And uh, I'm hoping that didn't happen, but we don't know. And, and all we can do is, is guess and speculate about what possibly happened to those cubs. But I think it's very safe to assume that she's lost those cubs. Uh, when we first saw her mating, there was a possibility, and it happens sometimes with lions, that because she's just given birth, she's got high estrogen levels, and those estrogen levels confuse the males to thinking that she's ready for mating, and, and quite often they will, they will just mate to placate the males. But the fact that it's gone on for so long and she's swapped males, I think it is, it is safe to assume she has lost those cubs. Um, those are the only set of Nkuma cubs we didn't see. So... As I said, it's very difficult for us to know what, exactly what happened. So we're now going to check along the northern edge of our traverse area, seeing if that mating pair didn't cross into Buffalo's Hook. And fingers crossed they didn't. Have some more coffee. So while we keep checking for these lions, track of a leopard. So let's go see how her tracking is going. My tracking is turning into something of the sort of Monday morning crossword puzzle. I think that's how Brent describes it and I think it was a brilliant description. You're out first thing in the morning and trying to puzzle out the clues. It's like doing a cryptic crossword designed by someone with a very tricky mind. Because Sindelia's tracks did not come out on the road, however, somebody else's tracks did. And it's either Shadow, well, it's a female leopard. It's either Shadow or Karula, and it's, in this area, it's most likely Shadow. So, the plot seriously thickens. And yet now I have to choose between trying to figure out whether to race to Cheetah Plains, to show you that surprise, or trying to find Shadow somewhere in here. It's a very tricky one. I'll, I want to show you the tracks, but I'm going to have to try and find a spot, a suitable spot to show you them. Now just bear with me while I try and search for a nice track example. She's gone off in here. And I said to Jandre as we came around the corner, one day I'm going to come around and there's going to be a leopard in this Balanites. One day it is going to happen. There's no leopard there, is there? No. I got so excited. I always get excited. Oh, wonderful news. Aubrey's here. Fantastic. I can show him the tracks at the same time. Yay. <coughs> Our orbs last tracks are just in front of me. Looks like she might have gone west into this block, but I'll point out the last one for you. Good example of these tracks. Some nitwit drove over them, and that of course being me. I can't show you these ones for good reason. I'll just wait a moment. 
They're so fresh, they're on top of another animal's tracks. There we go. I can show you these ones. Now I have to try and figure out how to show you these ones on this tricky slope. They are beautifully, beautifully fresh. Oh, can you get those ones there, Jandre? Whew. That was a tricky spot. Let me just hop out and show you exactly which tracks it is that I am looking at. Because a leopard track can be very confusing if you're seeing it for the first time. Oh, just in... Oh, hold on. Are these actually his? Confusion now. These, these tracks look bigger in the soft side. Just sorry, just hold on one moment. They look smaller in soft sand. I don't know. I'm getting very confused with Cindile's tracks because they're so, so close to the size of a... No, 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 this is female. Definitely female. Okay, I feel better about my life now. <laughs> Brief moment of confusion. These ones are nicer. Here comes Aubrey along to have a look as well. Now, these are the nicest set of tracks, and we're looking here. There's a lobe of the back of the foot. This is the back pad, tracing it out. Here's the toes. And here is the back foot of this particular leopard. Complete with toes. Uh, with all animals, most, most of the mammals out here. How's it, Aubrey? Hi, guys. I'm gone in that way. Sorry, let me just, uh, one, one second and then I'm done. Alright, so front foot bigger and rounder, whereas the back foot is always smaller and slightly more elongated. It's sort of an oval as opposed to a round shape. You can see the difference there. The speed, sort of normal walking speed that this leopard was doing. I've got, oh, I'm going to just move out of the way now. <laughs> Morning everybody! Luckily my hat doesn't look ridiculous at all for our audience. I can't find my earpiece. It's gone. It's gone. Oh well. I have to I have to do drive without comms. Got it. This is now turning into an embarrassing spectacle. My beanie's going further and further up my head. No, Jandre. And I'm covered in grey paint that won't come off my fingernails. And I've got an audience that are looking thoroughly bemused. Uh, just shuffle away out of everybody's way. Do you think it's do you think it's shadow or do you think it's yeah yeah? Okay, awesome. Will you let me know if it crosses there? Thanks. Cheers, guys. Have fun. Bye. Thank you. Right, now that we've made an ex sort of, not an embarrassment of ourselves, it just got a bit, I just felt a little bit awkward there with them all watching as we did that track demonstration. Aubrey's going to go and check round, oh goodness, now Rusty won't go into reverse. There we go. Lovely, lovely, fresh leopard tracks. And at least I know that they agree with me. But they think it is shadow. So that was Aubrey. We also have a viewer called Aubrey. We probably have, maybe even have two viewers called Aubrey. But Aubrey is one of the guides at Galago, Voyatilla, one of the guest lodges that you can stay at here. And his tracker Will, William. So shadow has come out of nowhere apparently. It feels as though she just dropped out of the sky because there's no tracks on this road. I want to just do a loop around here and just double check that she hasn't got, she hasn't come back towards where she might have left her cub. But there we go, we were asking for an update on Shadow. She's here, she's on Juma, and I have to tell you that I was expecting that because when I was on Arethusa yesterday we had Saleeshe, the female leopard that has been pushing more and more into 
Shadow's territory and as a result she's going to encroach more on Karula's territory because she's smack bang in the middle of those two leopards and Karula's her mother and Saleheshe is not directly related to her, she's also much bigger than Shadow is and I think she's just going to slowly push in this way especially with, Shad with Saleheshe's daughter slowly getting to the point of being independent there are interesting changes in our leopard dynamics our females seem to be doing what happened with our males a year ago when the Anderson male started pushing Tingana west no, east, opposite direction it's exactly the same movement, just with the females instead of the males and a year later it seems as though Brent has decided he's going to go for a walk I'm sure he is hot on the trail of something very exciting. I don't know what it may be. I've got some of his Rwandan coffee that I'm now going to try. That is delicious. He was right. Truly delicious. And very hot and slightly crunchy. I'm pretty sure coffee shouldn't crunch. Oh well. Shadow didn't come from where I expected her to come from, but she might have just done her thing walking in this enormous, very, very difficult patch of vegetation. We're going to leave her. I'm going to make a judgment call here, and we're going to leave her because the surprise at Cheetah Plains is worth it. But with, I don't think I would have left if Aubrey hadn't been there, but Aubrey's going to follow up, which means that we've still got a chance of seeing her. But I have to choose. I have to make a choice and I'm going to make the choice to go to Cheetah Plains. And when I get there and when you see what we're going to see, then you'll understand why I made that decision. So don't hate me too much. I also think that it's going to be very tricky to find Shadow in this block. We don't have, we don't have any guarantee of seeing her, but there is a guaranteed something on Cheetah Plains. So we're going that way. My mind is made up. I've been struggling with the decision the whole time. And that is where we're going to go. Uh, while I put foot to floor to get us to Cheetah Plains in time to go and see the special thing, and send you back to Brent to find out where he went wandering to. How exciting! I didn't. Mean, I don't even know what Jamie's rushing to go see at Cheetah Plains. So I'm going to slowly make my way towards the shadow tracks and as we know over the last while shadow has actually been a very difficult leopard to track and I think that's because Cindile has been around so she's been trying to avoid him and in avoiding him she avoids us so hopefully we have a little bit of luck with shadow who's actually having a bit of a hard time at the moment uh, Saleh Hesh is now starting to move further to the east and pushing shadow deeper into Karula's territory and that is not something you see out on Cheetah Cutline very often um, but it could be because of the drought. Now, of course, normally that bird is a huge fan of fish, being an African fish eagle, but they will hunt squirrels and other things if there's no fish about. Here we go, and quite nice. I think this is the first fish eagle I've seen in many months, and since the dam started drying up and all the catfish are dead, now this is definitely the first fish eagle I've seen off Arethusa. Um, in the last five or six months. Oh, there he goes, the African fish eagle. One, oh, maybe it's up hunting squirrels. There he goes. Could be heading towards the Chitwa Chitwa Dam, which is one of the only major water holes left in the northern Sabi Sands, uh, well in, in this section at least. Um, there's a couple in Buffalo's Hook and there's one other south of Arethusa called, strangely enough, Big Dam. Very, 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 very creative naming of a waterhole there. Um, but that is outside of our travel zone. As we know, the Arethusa waterhole is nearly completely dry and it's only the really the pumped waterholes, Red Dam, Gallego, uh, Vuyatela, and Buffalo's Hook, I think, is going to be dry within the next month. So, 
it is making life a little bit easier for us as it does force those animals to those permanent water points. Dave, do you remember this spot? Oh, yes. This is where Dave and I had the longest ever honey badger sighting in wild earth history and it was on foot. And then we tracked a serval, which we didn't find, but we did manage to track a serval for over a kilometer until uh, it went into some rocky, rocky ground near one of the drainage lines there. Now this is, a, this is good honey badger territory around Cheetah Cut Line. I've um, seen them quite a few times here. It was actually right here where we saw those honey badgers, just beyond. We snuck up to the termite mound and viewed them feeding about 20 meters from us, digging up what looked to be dung beetle larvae. Oh, I'm going to have to have a morning meeting shortly. Well, hello, James from Springs. James is wondering about Pete's Pond, which is one of our waterhole cameras, and whether it's in Juma. It's not. It's not even in South Africa. It's in Mashatu in Botswana. Hello, hello, Andrew. Hello, how are you? Very well. How are you this morning? Good, thanks, man. You know, there's a dragon on your on your neck. Yeah. yeah oh, okay. Yeah, just yeah, just yeah, checking. I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Morning, everyone. Ah, Jamie's nice uh, fine, but shh. They don't know what Jambi's fun before. No, okay. <laughs> Cheers, Andrew. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Enjoy. Andrew nearly gave away what Jamie's rushing to. I'm hopefully you guys didn't hear that. Uh, or did you? But Jamie is making haste towards the east to the plains of the cheetah. And uh, hopefully there's some big cat surprise for you on in the eastern sectors. We're going to go, as I said, go try and find that leopard. I think all the lions have disappeared. And fortunately, uh, and, um, it happened while I was away, but I'm sure most of you know, uh, an adult elephant, unfortunately, ex for the elephant, expired in Buffalo's Hook, which literally means every single lion in the northern Sabi Sands is feasting upon an elephant. And unfortunately, that is out of our traverse area. Very rude of the elephant to die out of our traverse area. If they're going to die, we'd prefer them to die where we are. Uh, but we don't want elephants to die, of course. And remember, we're on a live African safari. And very interesting now, we're talking about dead elephants. And Terry Steele is wondering what happens to the tusks and are they protected from the ivory market? Well, at the moment, Terry, the ivory is still in the elephants, in the elephant, and uh, it would be highly ill-advised to remove it while there are um, sort of nine lions around it and uh, as soon as the lions move off uh, the tusk will be removed handed into the sabi sands and they will go into a vault so yes they are protected from the illegal ivory market and that elephant was not poached so don't worry about that it died of natural causes and we're probably going to find a few more uh, elephants and, and buffalo and hippo in particular are, are, are three of the, the major large species that are going to die during this drought. We've already started to see some signs on the kudu and the warthog and strangely enough, warthog are the first to show uh, sort of skin and bones uh, in, a, in a drought. Warthog and buffalo and we've noticed in all the big herds of buffalo we've been seeing over the last month or two, the very few little babies. So it's the old and the young that suffer the most and now, I know it's very difficult for a lot of people, but the last major drought we had in this area, uh, a very similar drought caused by El Nino, was in 1992-93. And at that stage, the Kruger, the Greater Kruger, which we are part of, had uh, 30,000 buffalo, and they dropped to 12,000 buffalo during that time. But in the space between then and now, the buffalo population has gone up to 50,000. So the genetics of the buffalo that survived the last drought produced really, really impressive buffalo that managed to breed very fast and, and bring back those numbers. So it's unlikely that we're going to, because of the buffalo population, we're not going to drop as many as we did in 92, 93. But also, if we get good rains with the elephants clearing out a lot of the areas, you're going to have lots of space for your, your decreaser grass species, your panicum, your thermida, the grass that the, the, bra uh, the grazers really, really like. So you'll find that population will bounce back very, very quickly. Now, with the elephants, uh, elephant populations control themselves. 
So let's take northern Botswana, for example, which is the largest free-roaming population of elephants in the world. There's estimated anything from 150 to 250,000 elephants. And uh, every year, four or 5,000 elephants die. And, and it's natural. And then in a drought year, you might get 10,000 elephants that die. But we, you can't look at the individual. And, and, and I know it's very difficult as, as people not to look at the individual. Because if you look at the wider scheme of things, uh, even in a, in a population like South Africa, uh, where we've, in the greater Kruger, we've got about 17,000 uh, to 20,000 estimated elephants. If 5,000 die, it actually doesn't affect the, the meta population. Well, there's Jamie speeding past us. And of course, you'll notice Jamie's got a third person on the back. And that is, I'm actually going to leave it as a surprise who the third person is the back. You'll what find out. Off, 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 move, move, move. So, Jamie has some rubber to burn. Uh, we are, of course, going to continue at a far more sedate pace because we're not burning rubber. We're going to go try track a leopard. Emphasis on the word try with shadow at the moment. But as I was saying, so a, a death of 5,000 elephants in a population of 20, um, although on the short term it, it seems like a major thing, if you, if you look at the system over a long term and over a sort of a wider picture, the death of 5,000 elephants, as sad as it is, doesn't actually affect the core elephant population. So I know it's, it's not nice that the elephants die, but to a degree they're going to die because we're running out of space for elephants. Uh, not yet, and uh, there's a, a lot of people, some people say we've got too few, some people say we've got too many. Uh, but nature has an incredible way of, of maintaining itself. So a drought is, an, is sometimes a good thing because certain animal populations might be getting too high uh, for the current environment and a drought will help bring those numbers down. And of course, if you like big cats, there's no animal that likes a drought like a big cat. Uh, it is a time of plenty for lions and leopards and cheetahs and wild dogs and hyenas. So, if you're a big cat, it's a great time. If you're a buffalo, not such a good time. I just want to find out exactly where Jamie left those tracks. Jamie, Jamie? Jamie, where were the last tracks of that leopard? Gobby, thanks. Okay, so it seems to be right at the Balanites tree. And she said I should go check Triple M. So that is the boundary between Juma and Arethusa. And so if those tracks have crossed into Arethusa, we'll go to Arethusa. Oh, Aubrey has checked Triple M for us already. So there's no tracks of that leopard going to the west. So I think we're going to come in and check Zoe's road uh, and maybe around the Gauri repeater. And if it is shadow, she does like that area a lot. And if we're lucky, maybe she's got her cub with her. So of course, as all, you all know, while Jamie rushes towards the east, there's a couple of spots where she uh, might get signal breakup at the bottom of the Mawati drainage line, a uh, Mawanini drainage line. So you stuck with us. And uh, we do have a spotted creature to show you, but it is not a big cat. Don't fly. There we go. Hello, mister. It's got some spots on it. It's a yellow-billed hornbill. Let's try and move forward a bit. Oh, that's what he thinks of us. Say when, Dove. There we go. So as we drove past, unfortunately, he jumped off the edge, but he was basking in the morning sun. He might come do it again. Actually, I think I've got a better shot for you, Dave. You come there. How's that? Here we go. So a yellow-billed hornbill. You can see that massive beak. Now, being bitten by a hornbill is quite a painful experience. There we go. Well, we're going to leave that hornbill to bask in the sun. He's not being very photogenic this morning.
Well, good morning, Mary Ann. And Mary Ann's wondering about one of my favorite families of birds we get out here, which is the honey guides. And she is wondering whether we have any honey guides within our Travis area. Uh, we do. Uh, I've only seen one species here, but there's possibly a second species. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's unlikely due to our habitat that we're going to get the second species. Um, so we get the greater honey guide, which is the most common. We've actually, was it you with me, Dave, when we saw the honey guide? No. It wasn't, I think it was Brian. So I was actually off the vehicle uh, looking at a dwarf boar bean tree. Oh, 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 talking, 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 turn, turn it down. Um, and on a dwarf boar bean tree, and the, the honey guide actually saw me get out of the car and started calling it to me, Victor, Victor. So it was trying to get me to follow it back to a, uh, to a bee's nest. And that is the only honey guide I think I've ever put on, on camera here. And uh, I know it was a new bird species for a lot of you. And if you are new, some of our viewers are on over 230 bird species live on camera. And that is incredible. I think there's quite a few guides in the Sabi Sands who'd be jealous of 230 species. But yes, we do get honey guides. Greater honey guide is the one we get here. Now, we do get, uh, oh, what's it now? Oh, I'm going, my brain isn't working this morning. Uh, Sharp-billed honey guide uh, can occur in the Sabi Sands. I have seen it in the south. Generally, they prefer uh, river rhine areas. So along the Sand River or the Sabi River, you're gonna find a sharp-billed honey guide. And um, actually where I live, uh, on the on the riverbed, uh, where my parents live on the riverbed, we actually have one that comes uh, and sits outside my parents' bedroom window and calls constantly all day. And it's quite a special bird. A lot of people, or twitches as they're called, travel big distance to to see that specific honey guide. Now, there was a honey guide I looked for when I lived in Gabon. It's called a lyre-tailed honey guide, and. It is one of the rarest honey guide species in the world. And it's got this massive tail and it's got this incredible display, which I unfortunately never saw. Uh, probably because I was below the forest. I heard them calling, but I never actually got to see them. So they literally take off from the top of a tree and they open this massive tail and they call and they spin as they come down going. And it is an incredible thing to behold. Oh, I'm causing a major traffic jam. Let me get off the road. There's about two cars. Here we go. Sorry about that. Carry on. Bye. Off you go. We'll go this way. Uh, we're going to head towards, as I said, the Balanites tree where those tracks were. And oh, there we go. Some birds. And you got it, Dev? There. And that tree. Oh, it's flown to the next tree. That one there. Oh, that one there. Almost, I think it's where my finger is, more or less. There we go. Now, that is a difficult one because it's the female. And it's not as pretty as the male. I did see the male as well. But it's a good one for our birders to test. Now, what I would recommend... Oh, it's off. As I say, I'd get some screenshots before it disappears and then try ID it from that. Um, oh. The male is, is the male in that tree as well. Oh, they've flown off. Oh, on the ground now. You got it there, Dave? Yeah, okay. Dave's got it. Let's have a quick look. It's hopping around at the base. Oh, it's gone again. Oh, dear. Well, I'll be very impressed with that brief sighting if anyone can ID that bird. So this is your uh, nearly impossible quiz for the morning. Oh, what bird was that? And I did tell you it was a female. The male's a lot prettier and much easier to identify. So this is one for the twitches, since we have been talking about birding. What bird was that? If you know the answer, pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And just to let everyone know, um, we, as a lot of our regular viewers know, we do do school drives from time to time. In about 20 minutes, we've got a school joining us for the first time ever. So very exciting. So we will be, unfortunately for our regulars, concentrating on questions from the school.
Oh, hey. Minjan. Oh, no, no. Ah, and four. There's Aubrey from uh, Juma. Where's, where's the leopard? No, man. Aubrey, Aubrey's supposed to get a leopard for me. Like, it's... I, I, I can't track, you know, so he's got to help me. <laughs> ah, thanks, Orbs. Cheers. Cheers, guys. And just to let you know, there has been a leopard seen, and they've all seen it, but unfortunately, again, it is just to the north of our traverse. And it's the old man, Mvula. Now, Mvula gave me a spectacle my last morning before I went to Rwanda, uh, where we had him and Sindile fighting in a tree. It also, uh, that morning, uh, I, I said a bad word, and Khat and, and I nearly, 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 nearly disappeared into a drainage line when the clutch on Wendy failed completely, and we were sitting at about 35 degrees, so it was steep enough that the brakes didn't even work. But fortunately, we managed to, after the bad word, get ourselves out of that situation. And again, I do apologize for that bad word. I try not to use bad words, but when one is plummeting towards a steep ravine, um, it seems the choiciest word to use. Choiciest. That was absolutely vile English. I apologize. Okay, so while I berate myself of the horrific use of the English language, um, Jamie has arrived at Cheetah Plains, so let's go see what she's up to. We have indeed arrived at a Cheetah Plains and I'm making my way towards that sighting. Unfortunately, I still need to communicate with some of the other guides on the Game Drive channel and they can't hear me and I can't hear them right now. I'm making my way closer to where I know it is, the surprise, the great surprise, and then I will try once again to jump in on that lineup. Is also so? No. Oh, I'm not 100% sure because I can't really hear, but I think there's a Birmingham boy somewhere here. Oh, we'll have to. Ah, oh, missed my chance, missed my chance. Darn. Oh yeah, let's go this way. Our uh, last stations, where, where's that lock? The middle Dangala? That could have been Russian Greek. I have no idea what he just said. No idea. Oh well. We'll find out, never fear. I have ways and means of solving that particular problem. One of which is to just keep driving until I bump into someone. Uh, do you copy? Uh, confirm it's an open lock. Copy that. I'd like to join you at the second sighting. Nearly gave it away. Copy that. Awesome. Thanks. I'll see you shortly. Yay! I can hear things. The Birmingham boy turns out the word that I couldn't understand was in coral. Now that's not going to happen, unfortunately. That is north of our boundary. Luckily some person took mercy upon me. Oh, it's Dave's favorite tree. Dave, of course, was grievously injured by a monkey thorn when he tried to help me move it out of the road. It was most tragic and he was very stoic and brave about it. You can ask him, oh little, little one, ask him all about it. Okay, cantering zebra, but we don't have time, unfortunately. I'm very sorry, but we've got places to be. I love zebra. <laughs> it's twice today I've rushed us past a zebra sighting. There's just something too exciting to keep under, I've got to keep under wraps. And I nearly gave it away, hello Zebra, nearly gave it away on the Game Drive channel. 
and I know that we have a question about what language it is that we speak on the Game Drive channel. That came from Lee Middleton. Lee, we speak in theory. It's, it, it, it's almost like guiding vernacular because it's such a combination of different languages and it's actually a real bugbear of James's. He gets very irritated at the mangling of languages that occurs, but it is a combination of Zulu, Shangon, and sometimes a little bit of Sutu thrown in there as well. And then what we call in South Africa, South Africa, Fanagalore, which is a hodgepodge of all of the language to kind of create a communal language that everybody understands and speaks to greater or lesser degrees. So that's and we do it for a couple of reasons. One of the big reasons is because if you've got a new group of guests on the back of your vehicle and somebody goes, oh, we've got a leopard here with a kill and it's got its cub playing or whatever, and your guests are going, well, why can't we go there? But I mean, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous thing because there's no, there's no point in hiding something like that. And as long as you explain to them, okay, we're very far away or we can't travel there, then you you can explain away the disappointment, which is why we often mix in English with it as well. But I don't want you to know what the surprise is. So right now I'm speaking cryptic on the channel. Can I approach the uh, second sighting that you just spoke about? That sort of thing. Okay, three in a row pan, which is two in a row mud. At the moment, they're pumping Cheetah Plains pan. They can't pump both. So they're trying to give, I think they're trying to give the area a rest around three in a row pan. Hello Zebbies. Oh goodness gracious. Today's a zebra day. Sure we can stop for a brief look. Sure we can. Lots and lots of zebra around at the moment. And Justin S. Yes, this is actually something we were speaking about yesterday. Uh, all of our zebra look round bellied, but of course zebra always look round bellied. It's impossible to tell whether or not a zebra is feeling particularly hungry on a given day. And that is, of course, because they're red crested corhan calling as well. It's because their digestive process produces a huge amount of gas, which then swells up the belly like a barrel and creates a cacophony of explosive sounds whenever they trot or run away from us. But yes, Justin S., it is true that you can tell the condition of a zebra by the, the state of its mane. If a zebra's mane flops over to the side, then you know that it is really not very healthy at all. So a zebra, because they are bulk grazers, actually seem to be, they all seem to be in relatively good condition for now. They eat they can, they don't have to, they have, wait, let me just stop that whole sentence again. <laughs> Sean is laughing at me. Um, they have to eat more than ruminants, but their digestive system processes it, pro, oh, for goodness sake, processes it faster. There we go, because it's a faster system, it's not as effective. So basically what that means is that they can just keep eating and eating and eating and eating until they meet their nutritional requirements because their body processes it so quickly. Unfortunately, it does mean that they don't get, in the same way, they don't get the maximum nutrients out of the food that the ruminants do. I hope that was all clear to you. It was, I think, an entirely coherent sentence. It went very well. Because I'm so excited about the sighting we're going to. Ooh. This mud pan is starting to smell a little bit. Now, although they look like striped horses, and of course, immediately you spring to mind the idea of domesticating them, Zoe Dawn, zebra, tame zebra are horrible things. They do not, you want to know whether or not there's ever cases of them being habituated in local villages or something similar. Zebra are, first of all, obviously their backs are not built for work, so it's not an animal that has been domesticated to bear loads or bred to bear loads 
Hello, Zebra. You see them pss, sort of nipping at each other. It's very difficult to tame a zebra. It doesn't work. I have never ever encountered one habituated zebra that I've got on with. I've been bitten by one. Uh, and I have seen many, many other people being bitten by others. They don't, they just don't domesticate easily. Bear in mind, of course, that horses have been domesticated over thousands of years of breeding. And a very warm welcome to Mrs. Livingston's class at St. Benedict's. It's really, truly wonderful to have you on board. Now, just to explain a little bit about what we do and to introduce myself, my name is Jamie, and I have a man called Jandre who sits behind me with a camera. He's quite camera shy, but you might see his thumb every now and again. Now, what you're seeing on your screen is actually in real life here in a game reserve called the Sabi Sand. Now, most of you, I think, will have heard of the Sabi Sands, uh, but all of you, I imagine, will have heard of the Greater Kruger National Park. Now, we are right at this moment on the boundary of the Kruger National Park, and it's wonderful to have you on board. It is happening. What you're seeing is happening right now. So what that means is that you guys can actually ask me questions, anything that you want to know about the animals out here or what we're seeing, we can answer them straight away. Now we're starting off our morning safari, and you can imagine that you're on a morning safari. You're starting off with some zebra. And we've just been chatting a little bit about their digestive process. And we have a question coming through from uh, Alexi about how fast a zebra can run. Uh, fast is the answer. Sorry, I know that sounds like a ridiculous answer. I'm just trying to think exactly what it would be. You're probably sitting at about at its fastest at a sprint, 50 odd kilometers an hour. Maybe even a little bit faster, possibly up to 60. Bear in mind that actually maybe even faster. Come to think of it, if a cheetah can run at 120 odd kilometers at its absolute fastest sprint, a zebra can probably run at about 70, maybe even up to 80 kilometers at a, at a sprint. But then they can't maintain that speed for the whole time. Now guys, I'd love to stay with the zebra. However, I do have somewhere to be, and I'm not going to tell you where I have, where I'm going, because it's a surprise, but it is a very, very exciting surprise. I promise you, you're going to really, truly enjoy it. Uh, while I head across there, it's not just me out here taking a game drive. There's also a gentleman that would uh, like to say hello to you, and his name is Brent. Well, hello to St. Benedict's and Mrs. Livingston's class. Now, strangely enough, I know you guys might not know that, but my cousins actually went to St. Benedict's. So I have been to your school before, but welcome to the Sabi Sands. I'm actually on a dead-end road. And in front of me is how you are saying our picture. So this, we've got an aerial on the back of the car that sends a signal to that, which then sends a signal to the ladies in final control, which then sends a signal to you. Uh, the reason I'm on a dead end road looking at an antenna is there are leopard tracks in this area and I'm trying to find a female leopard whose tracks were around here. But I know Jamie's got a big surprise and she's rushing towards a sighting. And uh, so a very big welcome to St. Benedict's. And again, guys, if you want any questions, uh, send them through to me. I'll be happy to answer them to you. And I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Brent. And uh, you're on a live safari in the Sabi Sands. And I know Jamie explained uh, where the Sabi Sands is. So in a straight line from your school, it's probably about 500 kilometers. And I'm sure... Quite a few of you have been to the Kruger National Park, and we're on the western edge of the Kruger National Park, but there's no fence between us and the Kruger, so the animals can wander through. So I'm very excited to have a new school. So guys, please, I'm excited for your questions. And anything about the bush, if you want to know how to become a, a guide or anything like that, please let me know. And uh, I think we should start off, since you are at school and you're supposed to be learning, uh, we're going to start off with a question that you have to answer. So let's think. What do you think is a good one? And guys, I've got Dave, who's my cameraman there. You'll see his thumb. You never see his face. You just see his fingers. Uh, Dave, what do you think is a good question for a school? Hmm. Hmm. Nine years old. 
I know. Why don't you guys tell me what animals make up the big five? So come on, guys. I know you must be smart because you're at St. Benedict's. So let me know what animals make up the big five and send your answers through to me or to Jamie, yes, for that fact. So what animals make up the big five? Well, Hayden is our first question from St. Benedict's, and Hayden wants to know, do zebras have taste buds? They indeed do, but they're not quite as developed as ours. So uh, a zebra actually has quite a dull taste bud compared to certain animals um, because they are a bulk grazer. So that means they're not so fussy about what they eat, unlike their friend the wildebeest, who's very fussy about what it eats. So uh, zebras do have taste buds, and, uh, but they're not quite to the same degree as what we would consider our taste buds. Oh, the elephants have made a road block and have to drive around it. And as I said, we are looking for a female leopard um, whose tracks were in this area. So fingers crossed that St. Benedict's is going to bring us some leopard luck. Hi, Matthew. Matthew would like to know how I became a game ranger. Well, Matthew, I was very, very lucky and there was pretty much the only thing I was ever going to do was be a game ranger. So I grew up in safari lodges and, uh, and it was pretty much a natural progression for me to become a game ranger. Always loved the bush, always wanted to be in the bush. And I, I spent one year living in Joburg and it was definitely not for me. And so since I was 18, I've been a game ranger. It's all I really wanted to do. And I was very lucky that my mom and dad I work in the safari industry, so uh, there, was, I, I saw, there was no surprise that I became a game ranger. But the one thing I love about being a game ranger is I get to learn every day. So even though the bush, people might think the bush is the same, there's always something new. Every single day we out here, uh, we get to learn about something. And if we don't know anything, it's actually quite exciting because it means I can go home, I can read, I can learn more and more. And it is a very exciting job, and I'm sure there might be one or two future game rangers in, in your classroom. Well, as I said, you must be smart, and you got the big five right. It's leopard, lion, buffalo, elephant, and rhino. Now, I was only asking you what the big five is because I've got a harder question to you. What is the small five? So, Mrs. Livingston's smart class, let's see how smart you are. What is the small five? And we know what the big five is. Now, the small five take their names from the big five. So, let's see if you guys can work out what that is. Now, you'll see me talk on the radio from time to time, and that's because I'm in contact with all the other cars around, and we're all working to try to find these animals together. So if someone finds an animal, they'll tell me on the radio and I can go there. Uh, or if I find an animal, I can tell other people where the animal is. So I'm going to be on the radio quickly because I'm on the border of two of our areas. So we can drive on Juma and this is Arethusa. So I've got to change radio channels to find out what's happening on Arethusa. Uh, morning stations, can I have an update for Safari and Dal, please? Standing by. Copy, thanks. So I'm going to go try follow up. <laughs> Exciting stuff. There's a female leopard and an adult cub that was seen a little bit to the south. So I'm going to speed up a little bit because they are moving towards our boundary. So I'm going to. Darby, thanks very much, Darby. Um, okay, so she is heading south towards our boundary, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. And John is wondering uh, if we have wild dogs here. We do, and wild dogs also happen to be my favorite animal of all the animals we see. Uh, I love lions, leopards, elephants, and parlor and kudu, but for me, wild dog is the best animal. They're the most exciting to follow. Uh, and they go really, really fast. So I get to drive really, really fast after them. 
Okay, so we are going to speed down towards the south uh, and hopefully we'll catch up with that female leopard and her adult female cub. Uh, we can't really call her a cub anymore. She's over a year old, so we can probably call her a sub-adult. And uh, she is a, a relatively new leopard for us. So the, the leopard territories are changing at the moment. And this female leopard is moving further and further to the east, pushing the other leopard who I was looking for uh, into her mom's territory. So it's very interesting. That's what I'm saying. You learn something new every day. You get to see something new. And the, the different dynamics between the animals is constantly changing. And uh, it is a very, very, very exciting thing to be able to follow the lives of the different lions, leopards on a daily basis. So we are on safari for six hours every day, three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. And the reason we're on safari at those times, because those are the best times to look for animals. So Michael J is wondering, are water monitors dangerous? Uh, well, if you jump on them, they can whip you with their tail, and they do have a, quite a nasty bite and a lot of bacteria. So if you're just watching them, they're not dangerous. They generally tend to try and move away from you. But if you try to catch them, they can be dangerous. Sorry, guys, it's going to be on the radio quickly. Uh, sorry, stations, update from uh, the north. Uh, there's a filet and clove in Buffelshoek, and all the Angala are on it at the moment. So, as I said, we talked to everyone on the radio, and there we go, there's one of the other game drives, we're just going to say hello to Roy as we go past. Morning, 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 morning. How are you? Hi, Roy, nice to see you. I'm trying to go fumble for Salah Hirsch. Hopefully she hasn't crossed. Yes, okay. Okay. Enjoy, guys. Good luck. Cheers, Roy. Cheers. So yeah, it's going to be on the game drive again. Great. Just got it. Update. Ah. Too much talking on the radio. I'll let, let them finish before I talk. Yeah, that um, mating pair also went north this morning. So here we go. So there's a, a dead elephant, but outside our area, and all the lions are there. So that's why uh, I don't think we're going to see any lions, but hopefully we can see some leopards. Alex is wondering, how big do lion's paws grow? Now, a big male lion, Alex, can have a paw that's just a little bit smaller than my hand. Probably as wide as my hand, but not as long. Um, so, let me think. So, a side plate. So, not quite as big as a side plate, but a lion, big male lion's paw would fit into a side plate quite nicely. The female is, of course, a bit, a bit smaller. So as you can see, we're in that dry season. And you can see not a lot of grass around and all the trees are losing their leaves. But now talking about other creatures, I think uh, Tiani would like to know what is the most venomous snake we get here in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. Now that of course would be the black mamba. And uh, we're not likely to see one on a morning like today because it's a bit cold. Uh, but we do see them on Game Drive. We've had some incredible sightings of the Black Mamba. And Black Mamba is also the second biggest snake we get here after the python. And the biggest Black Mamba I've ever seen was over four meters long. So uh, if you want, if you know how big a meter is, if you step out four meters, that's how long that snake was. Biggest Black Mamba I've seen in, the, in, in this part of the Sabi Sands is about three meters. So, as I said, 
uh, Jamie has a surprise, uh, and I didn't know what it was. I thought it was something else, I thought, but I was completely wrong. But Jamie possibly has the cutest creature that lives in the African bush. So let's go have a look at it. The cutest and fiercest creature that lives in the African bush. We have a bundle of lion cubs just for you to enjoy. Aren't they absolutely incredible? Uh, their mothers have caught a kudu. Most of it has already been finished but the cubs are now devouring what is left of it so a little bit gory but still amazing to watch. Oh. Just listen to the sounds they're making. predators. <laughs> that lioness is not happy with them. She's got a full stomach, she's just been hunting and all she wants to do is lie down and sleep and give herself a clean. <laughs> and now the cubs are irritating her. Now, although she looks, she's making a very scary face at them, she would never ever hurt them in a serious way. She's growling, scaring them away, but it doesn't seem to be working very well, does it? They are not in the slightest bit bothered by her lack of interest in them. Oh, they even want to come in for a bit of a cuddle and a head rub. Even though she is capable of taking down an enormous buffalo, she is still phenomenally gentle with the cubs, even when she's cross with them. And she's basically shouting at them, disciplining them, telling them not to irritate her or to be in her personal space. But she does it really, really gently, so it looks scary, and there's lots of growling and rumbling, but ultimately totally gentle when she pushed that cub away. Oh, and they're all gathering together now in one pile of lion cubs. <laughs> this is so amazing. It doesn't matter how many times you see these amazing little creatures. It never, ever gets old. And there's definitely two different age groups here. So two different mums. You'll be able to see that just in terms of the difference in size. We've got an older set of cubs and a younger set of cubs. And Laken, these lions were found, we actually followed their tracks for quite a long time as we drove along. We didn't find them, we, they, we already knew that they were here, but somebody managed to find them by following their footprints. Now you wanted to know on the subject of the footprints, how, uh, what the difference is between a leopard and a lion track. Well, the answer is, Laken, it's size difference. Uh, a lion track is about, just to give you a, a sort of a basic answer, is about double the size of a leopard track. Sorry, the cubs are being noisy again. Let's just listen. Already at only three months of age, they are already pretty much only eating meat. They are totally weaned. to fight for their right to a piece of the carcass as mom eats away. Sorry Lakin. The answer is a, a leopard track is about half the size of a lion track. Now a, a leopard track is probably about the size of a lion cub's track but you know immediately whether you're looking at a leopard or a lion cub. First of all because the shape is slightly different but most importantly because you'll never find a lion cub walking on its own. So if you see one set of tracks, because we know leopards live on their own, and we know lions live in groups, in prides, or if they are males, in a coalition, we know that they will always have other tracks with them. <laughs> they 
white noises are so adorable. They are so, so cute. Now, although the lion has a fearsome reputation, and that lioness just gave us a clear indication as to why, with her sharp teeth growling at the little cubs, the most dangerous of the big five is not a lion. It is, in fact, just in terms of statistics. So, Tayton, you were wondering about which of the, the big five is the most dangerous. The answer is the buffalo. The buffalo is the most dangerous of the big five, or at least responsible for the most human accidents. And that one of the biggest reasons is because if they decide to to charge, they usually go through with it. Whereas with lions and leopards and even elephants to a big extent, if they decide to charge you, they usually warn you first. So it's up to you to move out of their space if you have upset them in some way. I've, lionesses are much, much more dangerous than the male lions. They also, especially when they've got cubs, they are become far more dangerous. But even then, if you encroach on their space, if you upset them in some way, maybe you've come across, come across them on foot by mistake, they'll growl at you and they'll let you know that it's time to move off. So they give you plenty of warning. Oh. Brent said that these are the cutest things in the bush and he may well be right. Oh, are you exhausted? Have you got a very full stomach, little cub? And the wonderful thing about lion cubs is that they are constantly playing. Uh, Michael L, you want to know how old the oldest lion is? I think the oldest set of cubs is about coming up to four months old. This little one looks like it's a bit younger than that, maybe, maybe three, maybe even younger than that. But the oldest lion will be one of the lionesses, and to be completely honest with you, I don't know how old the oldest lioness is. Uh, I believe that she, one of them is coming up close to ten. And lionesses don't live much longer past about 13 or so in the wild. They may live up to 16 in exceptional circumstances, depending on how many lion, depending on how much food is available, how big her pride is, but they generally don't live for very long. They're kind of like big dogs in that respect. Ah. Oh. Uh, these lions between because there's only three lionesses they've I'm so distracted by this cub it's adorable <laughs> because it's just the three lionesses they have only killed a kudu it's big enough for them to have foolish bellies but Alex yes a lion if they want to a lion can a lion is capable of killing an elephant but only in a group and usually only in a group with males because a male lion is about 100 kilograms heavier than the female, if not more, up to 150 kilograms heavier than the female. So they can get up to about 200 to 240 kilograms. Well, they, they're much, because they're much heavier, they're also much stronger, which means when they hunt with the females, they can help take down bigger prey. Well, there's not many cases in this part of South Africa of lions killing elephants because it's very, very dangerous for them. So they don't want to risk injury unless they are desperate for food. There are cases, especially in Botswana, and it seems as though specific lion prides learn to hunt elephants. So there's cases in Botswana where when it gets really desperate for the lions, they will, they've learnt to hunt elephant, and it's usually young male elephant. Somebody's got scabby knees. Oh, it's a perfect place to sit. Lexi, you wanted to know then how does an elephant defend itself? Well, usually, because they're so big, they can just chase off the lions. And if it's a member of a herd, if it's a female or a calf, the rest of the elephants will try and chase that those lions away. They'll usually help to protect it. But young males that are on the outside of the herd, they don't necessarily get that same level of protection from the rest of the elephants. But an elephant can defend itself by swinging its trunk and with huge tusks that, well, not necessarily tusks, but those that have tusks can use them to hit the lions. But basically, they are up to five, six tons in weight. They just need to stand in the direction of a lion and the lion will run away because they could easily get hit by the trunk or kicked or squashed. 
Now, this little one isn't quite ready to go hunting any elephants just yet. And welcome, Hayden. I hope you are enjoying this amazing view. A <laughs> that mom looks so irritated with them climbing all over her. All she wants to do is sleep. <laughs> Hayden, um, in terms of how many cubs a lioness can have, they can have up to six, but they usually in this area in particular average around two or three cubs. Oh, oh it's bedtime. Nap time for little cubs with full bellies. Oh, it, it, the first year of a cub's life is its when it is at its most vulnerable, especially in those first few weeks when their eyes haven't properly opened, their ears haven't even started to stick up yet, and their moms have to leave them alone in order to go and hunt and find food for herself. And they get left alone, hidden away, because they're too small and too weak to keep up with their mother. And that's the time when that life is most dangerous for a lion cub, because anything could find them. But these guys have been lucky, they have survived, and once they reach a year old, then their survival will increase, their survival chances will increase tremendously. Now, Chad, we don't have any white lions that we know of here, but we are in an area where you could potentially see them. Oh, where are you going? Are you going on an adventure? Are you going exploring? What a brave little lion cub. Sorry, Chad, I will answer you properly in a moment. Right, he's off, he's had it, he's gone. Kudu's finished. Oh, I'm going to go and have some space from... <laughs> Talking to the younger cousin. What are you doing? Sorry, Chad. I got interrupted because there's just too many places to look. The, we could actually indeed get white lions in this area. Oh, hold on, there's a little cub walking right next to the car. Just look at that. Isn't that incredible? See how comfortable they are with us? They didn't even look at us. Just moving off to go and find the rest of the... Oh, got company. And our bold lion cub is off on another adventure, leading his younger cousins astray. Where are you going? Looking for some space, I think. I'm calling, calling, calling. Sorry, Chad. I keep getting interrupted because these lion cubs are just so amazing. Chad, we could get white lions here. So the, the famous white lions are in the Timbavati area which we is one of our neighbors. Oh goodness, cubs everywhere. It's one of our neighbors, so they, the lions could move from the Timbavati to here. And of course, a white lion is just a normal lion with a strange genetic pattern. So a lion could be this color, tawny colored, but she might carry the genes for a white lion. And if she mates with another lion with those genes, then there is a chance of a white lion being born. Now, there's always the possibility that a white lion will be born in this area in the future, but we don't have any at the moment, at least not as far as I know. Look at them all. They're all going on <laughs> down the road. Now, I mentioned that lions are not the most dangerous of the big five because they usually give you a warning when they are upset or when you're too cl close. Lakin, yes, I have. Oh. I have been given a warning by lions before, um, lots of times actually. So what we sometimes do is we get out of the car to go and look for lions, so we track them. And even then, sometimes we're just walking in the bush, and you can imagine, sometimes you just accidentally find a lion. So I've been warned by lions before, and the very, very important thing to remember is you must never, ever run. Never run from a lion. Because as soon as you start to run, they start to realize that they've got the advantage and that you are, and then it makes them think that you are prey. So you never run from a lion. You can walk backwards slowly, but never ever run. And the truth is that lions are far more afraid of people during the day than that we are of them. Uh, 
Uh, these guys are just starting to get their adult teeth, their permanent teeth. They have milk teeth, just like you or I. Uh, we have got a question about how long a lion's tooth can grow. So the root is as long as the canine tooth itself. So I've been lucky enough to see a lion's tooth before. It is as almost including the root. It is almost as long as my hand. Uh, the the tooth part that sticks out is about this long, about probably about the length of my finger, but less there. That's how long the tooth part is. And then there's a root to hold that in place. That is this long. The so lions' canines get really really big. And they have to have a big strong root to help to keep that teeth, the teeth in the jaw, especially when they're trying to use them to catch something like this kudu that she's busy finishing off. And well done, by the way, for our class, for being so brave. I know that some of this is a bit yucky. And Hayden, you are thinking about the lion's comfort because now they're all sleeping and you know it's midwinter here. It is quite chilly and it's a cloudy day and actually Hayden this is the temperature that lions like the most. They like it when it's a bit cooler because lions get hot very very easily especially when they've just eaten because their whole digestive process when they're breaking down the meat inside their tummies it produces a lot of heat. A great deal of heat it makes them very very hot which is why lions usually sleep during the day but they seem to like the cold weather better. Look at that serious face. <laughs> it's just sort of absent-mindedly scratching its face. It's not even really concentrating on the scratch. <laughs> so cute. Sorry, I'm so distracted by the fact this is the first time I've seen these cubs properly, so I'm really, really excited. I've heard so much about them. It's the first time I've seen them properly. Trent, sorry, let me try and answer your question as we look at this cub's big round belly. Somebody's been gorging themselves. Trent wants to know how much a lion can eat in one sitting. So the amazing thing about all predators, Trent, is that they eat really, really quickly, as much as they can, as quickly as they can, because they never know when they're going to lose that kill to something like a hyena, for example. So all predators, lions, leopards, cheetah, they eat really quickly and they stuff themselves. Even when they are full, they still force themselves to eat. A lioness can eat up to 20 kilograms of meat in a, in a, in in terms of when she finishes off a meal. She might not eat it all in one go, but that's a lot. Think about how much that is. But she'll eat that over about a period of about three days, maybe even less, because in this case she's had to share a kudu with three lioness, well, two other lionesses, and a whole bundle of cubs. And hello to Sky. I don't know where to look. I'm looking everywhere. I'm trying to have eyes in the back of my head. Sky, it's wonderful to have your question. You wanted to know how long, how old a lion cub would be before it leaves its mom. If it's a female Sky, it might never leave its mom. It will actually stay in her pride. And there we've got them. Look, already showing signs of plenty of independence. Quite happy to go wandering down the road and sleep there. So that's because lions are social cats, they are, their bonds between the family members are really, really close. So pride is actually made up of females and their sisters, aunts, mothers, cousins. It would be a whole group of females. But if a cub is a male, then at about two and a half, three, sometimes even up to three and a half years old, is when they get kicked out of the pride. And sometimes they don't even want to leave, but their moms no longer tolerate them in the area and their dads don't tolerate them in an area. Uh, we always think of a pride of lions as being a male with some females and that's not actually how lions work. The, fe the females are part of the pride, females and their babies are a pride and then you get males that move through an area that have a territory with the females but they are something completely separate. Now they are called a coalition might be one single male or it might if it's lots of males then it's called a coalition of males 
and a coalition of males can have lots of different prides that they spend time with. Oh, kick to the face. Oh, now smack with the tail, just to finish it off. <laughs> you got to be tough if you're a lion cub. Sure, Connor has asked a really, really good question, which is how many types of animals do we have in the Sabi Sands? Oh, Connor, so many. I'm actually not even sure how to begin to count because, of course, we've got all of the mammal species and we've probably got up to about 20 different types of antelope. Then we've got all the big cats, so now you're looking at maybe 25, including hyenas and wild dogs, and then you go up to 30, including things like elephants and buffalo and giraffe. But that's just the mammal species. But in terms of animals, we've also got over 300 different types of birds and... Lots and lots. Too many insects for me to even tell you how many insects we have. I don't even know how many insects we have. And then there's the snakes and the crocodiles and the rock monitors. But we've got so many different types of animals. Now we're really lucky because we're sitting with lions and we're sitting with lion cubs and a kill. And that's really, really exciting. But it's important to remember that it's not being in the African bush is not just about the sightings like the lions or the leopards or the elephants. It's also about the small things as well. It's about learning about the insects and the trees and the way that everything interacts with each other. So we've got lots and lots of different types of animals. I couldn't even begin to count how many we have. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands even, including the insects. Lovely lady is finished eating. She's got a very round belly and she's going to go and find somewhere to sleep. She's probably going to, is she going to go up to that other lioness? It looks like it. Oh, no, she can't even make it that far. She's too full. Her belly is too heavy. Now this pride is called the Styx Pride. But we've got lots of different type, different prides in the Sabi sand. Michael L. was wondering just how many different lions we have. If I had to guess, give me a second, Michael L. I'm just trying to work it out. The, the Sabi sand is about 60,000 hectares, give or take. And about approximately every 4,000 hectares, there's a lion pride. So I don't know exactly. I'm just trying to work out a good number, a good estimate for you. Uh, let's say... Hmm... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still trying to do maths, but I'm distracted by a sleeping cub. It's very difficult to do maths when you're thinking about other things. Now, there's probably a good, maybe... 150 odd lines in the Savi sand, but I'll think about that and I'll try and give you a proper answer in a moment. Hayden, <laughs> a really lovely question coming through from you, which is, how big is a lion's brain and does it use it all? Which is a very good question because, no, they, they generally don't. They're very instinctive animals. They are, they hunt, they sleep, they're not in experiments that they've done, it shows that they're not necessarily problem solvers. They're clever in their own way. They're clever in terms of surviving. They're clever... I want to see what these cubs are doing as well. I don't want to turn my back on them for a second. They're clever in terms of survival and looking after themselves and each other. And their instincts are incredible. But they are not problem solvers in the same way that we traditionally think of something being clever, like a chimpanzee or a gorilla or even an elephant or a hyena. Lions can't really solve problems. But that doesn't mean that they're stupid. It just means that their brain gets used for different things. Chandra, sorry. <laughs> I know we're looking at these cubs, but can we look at this cub now? <laughs> sorry. It's busy having a bath. And it's just too cute. bath time. And sorry Hayden, just to finish off your question, um, a, a lion's brain is about roughly the size of a tennis ball, just to give you an idea. So it's, despite the fact that their heads are enormous, 
Their brains are just, just a little bit larger than a tennis ball, mostly protected by the thick skull. How, Alex, how does a male lion know that he is the father of a cub? Well, Alex, once a male lion has established a territory, his territory will include a couple of different females, and he will know which females he has mated with. Now, even if the cub isn't his, even if he isn't the father, he will still think that he is the father because he knows that he has mated with that female or he knows that his brothers or part of his coalition, one of them, has mated with that female. So he accepts the cub as his own. Might not be, but he thinks that it is. And therefore he is geared towards not actively protecting it as in males don't really care for the lion cubs much, but... He does make sure that he keeps the territory safe from other male lions that might come in. If this is a female cub, this bond with its mother will last for the rest of its life. How, oh, Alexi? We, spoke, we speak about the different members of the Big Five now. And Alexi would like to know what is bigger, a male or a female buffalo? The answer is, Alexi, a male buffalo. And they are much bigger than the females. The females are big, but males are much, much bigger. Male, A big male buffalo can even reach almost up to a ton. Not quite, but almost up to a ton in weight. They are huge animals. Very important not to see them just as cows. They are very big, wild animals. Talking to mom. <laughs> oh, mom, don't want my stomach washed. Don't want my stomach washed. I want to play. Pretend I'm hunting you. <laughs> this is so cute. Now, big cats are true characters. Now, these females have had a hard time. These little cubs are the first litter of cubs that they have had in a year. And very, very sadly, the last litter was actually killed by the male lions that are now the fathers of these cubs. And it might seem really sad, it might seem really rough for us from a human perspective, but that's just the way that lions work. They're not governed by the same rules that human beings are. They just act on instinct. Oh, so many big bellies and so many exhausted little lion cubs. This is one of the younger ones. Interesting, some of them have got a skin disease. Oh, speaking of the male lions, I said that they've got lots of work they need to do in terms of defending their territory, but Skye wants to know where the male lions are. And the answer, Sky, is that they're spread out right now. So they don't spend all of their time with the females. They spend a lot of time with each other and quite a lot of time walking around, roaring, scent marking. So in other words, spraying their pee on the bushes to make sure that no other male lions come through. So right now, Sky, one is about... I would say about a kilometre and a half away from this. <laughs> okay, this is going to be very difficult. I can't move the car right now because I've got lion cubs everywhere. Oh, no. Luckily, she hasn't gone too far away. while we enjoy the lions clambering all over this lioness and we're going to stay here for as long as possible we're going to send you back across to Brent because as I said some of the learning is about different things not just lions, leopards and elephants so let's go see what he has to teach you
welcome back. So, as you can see, I'm not on a road. I'm just driving through the bush. And I am looking for a female leopard, but it seems like she is evading me this morning. But apparently you guys want to see some trees. Actually, there's, there's a nice tree. Now, oh, here's a nice tree. There's a nice tree. It doesn't have any leaves at the moment, but it's still a nice big tree. And I'm hoping while I look in the tree, we're going to find a leopard sleeping in one now. But so far, no luck. But there we go. That's a big marula tree. So you can eat the fruit. And of course, there's no fruit now. It loses its leaves during the winter months. There we go. A marula tree. Now, of course, everyone knows elephants like marulas. Uh, they don't only like the fruit. They also like to eat the leaves and the branches and the bark and we're going to show you while we keep hoping for a leopard to appear uh, what elephants can do to a tree and here's a nice one there so we elephants have tusks which are just special teeth and you can see this marilla tree is actually dead and the elephants have eaten a lot of it. If we look lower down, we can actually see where they've used their tusks. You can see here, so the elephant has pushed its tusk in here to rip off the bark. And this is dead bark. But normally, you see this red layer here. It's what takes the water and minerals from the ground all the way up into the tree. This marula tree has died, and it's probably died because of elephants. The elephants haven't taken all the bark around, but what happens when the elephants remove the bark, they expose the center here, and you can see these little lines and all the little holes. And those are from mostly from longhorn beetles or wood borer beetles. So once there's a little patch that dies, the borer beetles get into the tree, and marula is a very soft wood, and they actually kill. Oh, there's a big one. So there's a really big borer beetle. That's probably from a giant longhorn. And in Shangan, they're called Mbungu. And there's a very cool thing. So they're big white grubs. They get probably as big as this. And they're very, very tasty. Now, can you imagine eating a big white hoho, a big white grub? Uh, it tastes very nice. It's, it tastes like bacon when you fry them. But can you imagine bacon? It tastes like bacon, but it feels like snot. So it's very slimy, snotty bacon, but I quite like them. Um, and a tracker I worked with for many years, it literally, if he saw a dead marula like this, he'd want to push it down so he could get to all the grubs inside. And he used to fry them up, and he used to eat, I've seen him eat a kg of big white kohos. Um, he, he, he really liked those things. Okay, so unfortunately I think that leopard's evaded us, so we're going to head towards the Arethusa waterhole. Uh, maybe there's a hippo there, and the waterhole's nearly dry because we are in a drought. Uh, so you guys would like to know how many of those bugs I've eaten? Oof, over the years I've probably eaten a hundred or so. Uh, it's very, very rude to not except when you are given uh, a bug to eat. Now, I've eaten lots of different types of bugs. So I've eaten those, uh, giant longhorns. I've eaten lots of flying ants. I'm sure a few of you have eaten flying ants. And uh, so I went to a boarding school uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. You guys actually might play sport against them occasionally. And uh, called Hilton College. And I'm grew up in the bush so I used to have a teacher who lived with us in the bush so when I was your age I had a teacher who lived with us in the bush so and you guys are going to get a big shock I used to start school at five o'clock in the morning so my dad being my dad he's a, he's a different type of guy uh, we got a teacher who actually taught at St. Benedict's before she came to teach us amazingly enough so she came and she only taught my brother and myself and so my dad said well to your school what time do you want to start school as we lived in the bush, we said we want to start school at 5. So we started school at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we were finished school by 9.30 every day. And then we used to go out with the rangers into the bush and stuff like that. But uh, when I went to boarding school, and uh, I'd been living in the bush my whole life, and eating flying, flying ants is something we do. 
So at Hilton, we had a few kids who went to, who were from Joburg. And one of them was a, was a guy who'd never really been outside much. And uh, we had a, a big discussion and flying ants came out everywhere. And I grabbed the flying ants and he was like, oh, gross, I'll pay you 100 rand to eat it. So I was like, okay, will you pay me 100 rand to eat more? And I just kept eating and he kept giving me money till he realized that I would probably keep eating till he had no more pocket money left. So <laughs> it was quite funny. But we've got some impala here, a little group of boys. There we go. There we go, some impala. So these are all the boys without girlfriends. So young boys and old boys. Uh, the impala have finished chasing the ladies around for the moment, but they will start again soon. There we go. Hello, boys. Now, impala are one of the most awesome creatures. And you wouldn't think so because we see so many of them and they're quite often ignored. Now, a really interesting thing about impala is they're one of the most successful species and that's because they, they can eat grass and leaves. And they're so successful that impala have been exactly the same for 1.6 million years. So if you find a fossil of an impala, it is exactly the same as an, um, the bones of an impala now. So 1.6 million years they have been unchained. It's such a good design that they don't ever have to change. So if we take people, for example, we've only been in our current form for about 200,000 years. So impala are actually a much older species than we are. There we go. But Tiago is wondering about leopards and trees. So Tiago is wondering why do leopards put their kills in trees? And... Uh, what type of trees do they like to put them in? Well, in this area, they really like marula trees, like the tree we just looked at. But it all depends. Leopards put their, their kills in trees so they can protect their kills from lions and hyenas and, and other predators. And so they can eat till they're full, then have a nap and come back and snack later. Um, but a leopard will put their kill in any tree if they're being chased by a hyena or a lion. So the reason they, they generally put their kills in trees is to protect it from other animals. And uh, they will use any tree available, uh, but generally they'll try to use a nice big marula tree in this area. If you're around a little river, they'll try to use a, a jackalberry or an African ebony tree or a timberti tree sometimes, uh, or a, a weeping boa bean. But in our area, most of the kills we find are in marula trees. Oopsie. I think it was Tatum or Tatham would like to know, do we have honey badgers here? We do. We actually have quite a lot of honey badgers and we've been seeing them quite frequently. So it's always easier to see honey badgers in the winter because there's not lots of long grass like there is in the summer. And because honey badgers are quite short uh, in the summer months, we don't see them too often because they're below the grass. But now in winter when there's no grass, we do see honey badgers very often. Okay, so we're driving past Arethusa Safari Lodge, so that is where people from all over the world come to stay so they can go on safari, and uh, there's lots of guests from everywhere, South Africa, America, England, Germany, Belgium, Spain, Italy, wherever in the world people come to stay, and to come experience all these incredible animals. And that's the, one of the very cool things about what we do on these live safaris because unfortunately for some people either they're in a hospital or they're, or they're sick or coming to visit us in South Africa is too expensive. So they get to come on safari with us through the camera every day. Well, hi Cristiano! Uh, Cristiano would like to know, are the impala we saw dangerous? They're not at all. Um, all animals can be dangerous. Even a mouse can be dangerous if you corner it. But if they're out in the bush like this, impala are not dangerous at all. But sadly, it's time for you guys to go do some proper schoolwork. So it's been great having St. Benedict's with us on this sunrise safari in the middle of the African bush. And remember, guys, you don't only have to watch at school, you can watch us after school as well. And uh, you can do that 
on the web, on the interwebs, or the website, I'm, I'm very bad about interwebs and stuff like that, the internet, that's the word I was looking for, so you can ask your teacher where to find us on the internet, so you can watch us when you're at home after school, but now it's time for you guys to go do some schoolwork. So from Jamie and myself and the rest of the Safari Live crew, it's been wonderful having you and hopefully we'll see you again soon. So bye-bye to St. Benedict's. And again, hello to the rest of everyone. Thanks for bearing with us through the school. As you know, it's so important to enrich the youth and hopefully we've got some future game rangers and conservationists there. Now, I'm sure you guys are just dying to get back to Jamie and those lion cubs. Unfortunately, we couldn't find Saleh Hesh and her cub, Tiani. Um, they seem to have disappeared out of our traverse area. So without further ado, back to Jamie and those wonderful lions. I cannot, I still cannot believe that we are sitting here in this sighting alone. We've got this incredible moment all to ourselves. Just listen to these cubs. Oh, well, you could all choose this one moment to go quiet. This poor mom, at one point I counted five or six cubs attempting to suckle from her at one time. And she is allosuckling. In other words, she's suckling cubs from two different litters, one that's probably her own and then the other that isn't. We've got one large lion cub that managed to squeeze its way in there and have a drink and one and then a couple of the slightly smaller, slightly younger ones. Oh, this one is still intently focused and it has done very, very well to manage to keep onto that nipple because it's been absolute chaos, as you can see. Oh, oh, dislodge, oh, back again as quickly as possible before that nipple is stolen away from it. How utterly irresistible are these cubs? <laughs> I can't help feeling sorry for that poor lioness. She's just got cubs attached to her. She rolled over and it was, there were just cubs rolling with her. Around contented bellies everywhere we look. I mentioned earlier when we were with the on the school drive that I've noticed quite a few of them have got some kind of skin infection. Um, before we d d go too much into it, I'd like to do a bit of research before we talk about exactly what it may be. I've always noticed that with the Styx females, that they almost certainly have TB. We often see them with a little bit of blood running from their noses. Now that sounds terrible. It sounds really, really bad, especially for new viewers, but never fret. A t tuberculosis is a naturally occurring disease, and but a lot of the animals out here carry it. And they, they just are oh, just that. They carry it, they sometimes manifest minor symptoms, but it only impacts them in a hugely negative way if they are lost condition. So if they are hungry for some reason or injured. You see there's lots of patchy parts of their skin. I don't know if it's... So, and they're obviously, I mean, this cub's very, very itchy. And it's nothing to be hugely concerned about. It's just a naturally occurring, obviously, naturally occurring skin disease that they seem to have acquired. Which is what gives them the patchy, scabby bits around their elbows and their joints, and especially around this cub's face and the balding patches. This one's not so bad. I noticed it's worse on the some of the younger cubs. Oh, show me you itchy little one. And all of them have found their place. The pushing and shoving for now has come to an end. And we are getting to enjoy our very first proper sighting with the Styx cubs. All eight of them present and accounted for. And well, thoroughly well fed. And hello to Vicky in Chicago, who wants to know whether or not we can tell the difference or tell the sex of the lion cubs yet. Yes, we can. I'm trying to look for a good example to show you, but we can now tell, start to tell the difference. Obviously, their testicles for the young males haven't dropped yet, haven't descended yet. So it is a bit more tricky than it might be on a, a slightly older cub. 
but you will be able to, on close examination of their genital area, you will be able to see a slight difference in terms of shape to and positioning of the either penis or vaginal area and the rectum. So you'll see it in terms of where they're positioned underneath the tail. Um, there you go, we've got a, an example there. So here's the cub on the right. If we have a slightly closer look, I'm trying to work out exactly what it is. My suspicion is that is actually a male, just in terms of the positioning of the genitals and the anus. Mm, I think that might be a male. It is hard, it is tricky to tell initially in their first stages, but it does get easy very quickly because the males start to get fluffy heads <laughs> within a couple of months. And then, of course, their testicles descend and it becomes a great deal easier to tell the difference between the two of them. Oh, you guys are getting very comfortable. And of course, one thing we, sh we hope for whenever we see lions like this, I don't know, what I personally hope for, I don't know that I could actually put this opinion onto everyone, Personally, I would love to see lots of females in this, and the same with the Inkahumas, particularly after, with all of the chaos and the trials and the tribulations of the two prides that we see with the Birmingham boy takeover, it would, nice to, it would be nice to see a recovery of their numbers. The Styx Cubs lost, uh, the Styx Pride lost all of their cubs last year, and there's only the three of them at the moment. Uh, the, Styx, the Styx Pride is a bit confusing because they've got breakaways, and I, I never... I'm not entirely sure because some of the different lodges call the different breakaway prides a, a completely separate name. But it would be very nice to have a group of females. But then, of course, you also don't want one lone, poor lone male that ends up in a position like Julia where he has to go and wander off and try and find a friend to help ensure his survival. You uh, Maybe, I don't know, in an ideal world, <laughs> have three males and the rest females. I'm just flights of fancy. Now, Shamsun, the one thing that the male cubs will absolutely not be allowed to do is join their father's, sorry, the yep, piece about to fall off, is join their father's coalition. There's absolutely no way they'll be allowed to do that, which makes sense because if you think about what a coalition is about, it's about passing on the genetics. So if they were to join their father's coalition, they would end up inevitably mating with their mothers, sisters, um, cousins and so on. So it, it's a system that prevents inbreeding. So no, their fathers, their fathers will not permit them to join the coalition. There are one or two weird recorded cases of that happening, but you can see how ideally nature wouldn't want that to be allowed to happen. So they go off on their own. If there are males of a similar age in a group, then almost inevitably they leave together and they form a coalition together. If it's just one lone male, then he'll go off on his own when he is forced to. They often stick around a bit longer than the groups of males because they don't have any support system. It's a scary, big, wide world out there to be a lone male lion. It's a dangerous time of their, of their lives. But if they've got cousins or brothers, they will absolutely form a coalition. But don't, ma don't be fooled into thinking that all lion coalition, male coalitions, are related to each other. As I said with Junior, he's been trying to find himself a buddy. Oh, you're going to sit here. Oh, sorry, let me finish that sentence. I got distracted. Um, let's finish that sentence. They uh, can Male coalitions can also be formed by completely unrelated males. Right, we're going to sit here for the last few moments of the sunset sunrise safari. While we do, I know that Brent would like to say a quick farewell. I don't want to keep you away from those lion cubs for too long. So from Dangerous Dave, the objectified to dish, and myself, it's been a pleasure uh, having you on the Sunrise Safari. And I've come to a realization my cat streak has ended. This is the first drive that I haven't had a cat. Uh, I'm going to have to rectify that and start again on the Sunset Safari. So let's not waste any time and send you back to those gorgeous little lion cubs. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa is Brent. His cat streak has come to an end. Um, he's going to be utterly insufferable when we get back to camp this morning. 
<laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm sure his cat streak will be back with a vengeance this afternoon. We might see, maybe I might even let him take Rusty to come and enjoy this particular sighting, because we have to admit, it is utterly irresistible. Sleeping lion cubs. All, I think this is all eight of them now. It's, I can't even begin to do a head count because I can't see all of them bundled underneath each other, but I did count eight earlier, so all eight are present and accounted for. And I think this is what they're going to be doing for the rest of the time here. They might go for a drink. They're not far from three in a row pan, so hopefully if they do decide to go for a drink, they'll go north and not south into Mala Mala. We'll just have to hope that they decide to stick around. I mean, the, the carcass, let me just reposition slightly so we can see the carcass as well. Okay, little ones. Not even a one, one or two heads bobbed up, but other than that, no real. Um, let me see how I can do this with both. Can you get her there and have the cubs as well? A tree in the way. How tragic. Oof, I'm pushing my luck here. But no, I can't. I can't really. Well, I suppose I could just plant myself in the middle. It's okay, little one. It's all right. We stopped here. We stopped here. I can't really do too much. But as you can see, most of the kill has now been finished off, and there's really just the scraps that the female is feeding off. I think there's a chance that they might have moved by this afternoon, but hopefully they decided to go to water. It's also quite cool today, so they might be more mobile than they would otherwise be if it were 40 degrees. But prospects for this afternoon's sunset safari are very, very good. And perhaps another bundle of... and Once the lion cubs have digested their meal a little bit, perhaps they will be more intent on being playful as well. Just some bones, rib cage, and the big leg bones left. What an absolutely stunning way to enjoy the morning. Oh! Mom has rolled over, cubs flying. One brave little soul has managed to try, or trying to stay attached. <laughs> well done, little one. You definitely get the prize for persistence. <laughs> Climbing over mom to continue with breakfast. And thus, on this view, we end off our sunrise safari. We are sad to go, but excited for prospects for this afternoon. A big thank you to Jandre, as always, for his fantastic camera work. And I'm sure you're all very happy to see Brent back as well with Dave. And thank you to Rebecca and to Chelsea in Final Control. Most importantly, oh, look at that. <laughs> Sprawled cubs everywhere. Most importantly, a big thank you to all of you for joining us. I'm not, we're going to leave you with this incredible view for now and say goodbye to you all. Have a fantastic day and join us in a few hours.